Please rise to the Pledge of Allegiance, led by Anna Stanko. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God. Indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Chris Stapleton nailed it last time. We're good. Thanks. Uh, anyway, welcome to the first uh, board meeting of the month of February 2023. Uh, can I get a motion that the minutes of the January 23rd, 2023 meeting be approved? I'll make a motion. Trustee Fundainsa? I'll second. Trustee Raymond, discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Mayor's announcements, uh, three things tonight. Uh, first off, I wanna congratulate Dr. Jean-Leo Duca, uh, who is now officially the superintendent of the Balsa Spa Central School District. I attended the uh, school board meeting where he was officially installed last Wednesday night and uh, sent our uh, positive thoughts and support uh, to him into the board. I think it was a great uh, selection. Personally, I haven't gotten to know him over the last uh, few months, especially, and uh, definitely a rock star as far as the uh, school kids go, for all the way from kindergarten up to seniors in high school. So a lot of positive feelings right now about the leadership at this central school district, and he is going to come uh, speak with us some night to tell us about some of the initiatives going on in the school. Uh, I made a promise after uh, we're talking at that meeting, and he said absolutely, so we will see him soon. Earlier today, uh, 1 o'clock, we had a discussion with the merchants, uh, business owners, and the property owners on Front Street based on the idea of what's coming up in the spring, which is the Front Street improvements. Uh, we, uh, with Jeff Garis, uh, you know, myself mainly, I heard that joined us as a BSPTA liaison. Uh, we discussed that it's about a nine-week-long project starting at the end of March, hopefully ending before June 1st. Uh, we're trying to actually get there a little bit faster uh, in that respect um, and it, reassuring the business owners that we are not going to be blocking their entrances or inhibiting their ability to do business. Now, obviously, with some construction, from time to time, there may be parking spaces eliminated for certain small periods of time or ADA sidewalk ramping going on, which may... Yeah, take a piece of a sidewalk out of commission, but it will not take entire sidewalks out of commission. We will obviously uh, make sure that people try to use the opposite, opposite side of the street when possible and then can cross when they get to where they need to be destination wise. But uh, for the inconvenience, uh, albeit minor, that will exist, uh, this is going to be something that's going to be very positive overall to the street. Uh, I, if you drive over there or you see it after a storm, you know what we face right now. So the storm structures, et cetera, is a very important part of that project. And that's why it will take nine weeks to because you've got storm structures, you've got uh, the sidewalk work that'll be done. You've got the milling and filling of uh, pavement uh, and anything else that they find in the meantime. So uh, we're gonna have more meetings about this and discussions over the next uh, weeks. So stay tuned to that. But tonight or today, we wanted to focus, especially on the business and property owners on Front Street. I want to share some correspondence back and forth uh, with the county. This, uh, this topic has come up a lot with the folks that we're talking to. Uh, earlier uh, this morning, I actually finally caught up with some things because we actually are at, at a day off today um, because of uh, Lincoln's birthday, which is a celebrated holiday in the village. So finally, you got to catch up on a couple of things and sent this out this morning. Uh, Bernie, that and I had met with Matt Beach, uh, who is uh, one of the uh, supervisors in Saratoga and uh, the chair of Buildings and Grounds Committee for the county and uh, Administrator Steve Bolter for the county and sent them a thank you note uh, for our discussion. This was two Fridays ago, but uh, it's done it today. Uh, there, and I sent it to Chairman uh, Todd Kuznares. It's with great appreciation I write this letter to continue our ongoing conversation regarding the relationship between the Village of Balsa Spa and Saratoga County. Most recently met with Supervisor Matt Beach as chair of the Buildings and Grounds Committee and County Administrator Steve Bulger and was provided with an opportunity to further communicate my position and belief that it is important that the best interests of the village of Balsa Spa be a central part of this dialogue. I understand that the 
county continues to undergo a review and assessment of its facilities across the county. I appreciate the outreach to my office throughout this process and the, that the study considers the longstanding partnership between the village and the county that began when Balsam Spa was named the county seat more than 200 years ago. It is encouraging that our discussions not include not only the economic impact the county has in our village, but also how to best to improve and strengthen the relationship our respective government entities have in working and supporting each other. I request that we continue to work closely with one another and remain in contact regarding the study and its impending results and look forward to this process. As always, thank you for your time and consideration. Sincerely, yours truly. Uh, I was surprised to get a response uh, toward the end of this afternoon, actually, from Chairman Kuznir's uh, Dear Mayor Rossi, thank you for your recent letter communicating your support of continuing county operations and maintaining facilities in the village of Alston Spa. I understand the importance of having the county seat in your community and maintaining a strong partnership between our respective entities. As you know, our comprehensive facility study is looking at all aspects of our county operations and continues to evolve as we take deeper dives into how we can best improve our delivery of constituent services both now and in the future. I realize that having hundreds of county employees in the village daily contributes to the village's economy. Our board of supervisors is strongly supportive of our small businesses and understands the value they provide our residents and the important ways in which they contribute to our communities. While the assessment of our facilities remains ongoing, if it is recommended that any operations are moved outside the village, the county will work with your office to ensure that any impact on the village is minimized. Both our board and county administration will continue to communicate with you as we have been doing throughout this process and will keep you informed as our study and review process moves forward on any issues that impact both the county and the village. I appreciate your efforts to advocate on behalf of our community or of your community and the spirit of collaboration you foster between your office and the county. I look forward to continuing our conversation. Sincerely, Ty Kuzniers, Chairman. Uh, what I can tell you from our last discussion, and Bernadette, feel free to chime in on this too if you want to, but uh, they are taking seriously our request that even if some level of uh, operations were ever to move outside the village of Alsa Spa, that enough remains to be able to call the village the county seat, because that is a very important thing to many people, including myself, including Bernadette, I believe, and it seemed to be a well-received point when we're talking to uh, Supervisor Beach and uh, Administrator Bulger. So just know that we are in communication constantly with the county. And as things develop, we will keep you posted. But if uh, you want to go ahead. Uh, the only other point I wanted to bring up is the discussion that we had with the county of our concerns for our small business community. Um, I know for some of our business owners, that's a <coughs> concern. And we did bring it up, start those discussions with the county, you know, just to prepare, you know, if, if something, you know, they were to have to move. So they're open and want to work with us and want to work with the business community and, you know, minimize any impacts if they make a decision to move. Thank you. Did they give you any indication of what they would do to minimize if they did, you know, take a, a large number of employees out of the, you know, because they could leave one building, but it, could, it would still be a large impact. To the general consensus, if correct if I'm wrong, Bernadette, is that they would evaluate the financial impact to the, uh, to the village and ensure that it was minimized in so far as things that they could do to ensure that there was a balance achieved during any time that certain things would be offline. Now on the flip side, certain things, certain pieces of that property could become developable if that happens as well. So there would be not an infinite period of time uh, that that would be the case. So it's a balancing uh, act once they know what's going on. And, you know, I can't speak for the county, but you know, certainly there's a lot within their own resources with planning and um, opportunities to maybe work with us to help, you know, kind of re-envision what this, what kind of economic development could happen in our community. So again, I can't, I can't speak for the county, but those discussions were started. And that is it for Mayor's announcements. Uh, liaison reports, we'll start with Sean. Well, I'll be really brief because Jeff really hasn't sent me anything, <laughs> so. He's been busy, trust me. Yeah, yeah, he's been really busy. Um, but obviously, um, thankfully, we don't have a lot of snow to remove. Um, 
last few weeks. And I know he was proceeding with the signs. I know he's got the pedestrian crossing signs up in a lot of locations. So that's good to see. And uh, other than that, moving forward, um, he, I guess if we still have snow left, he's going to be involved with the winter festival. At some point. I don't think uh, at this point uh, that's going to happen. Uh, I'm, I'm a wishful thinker. <laughs> Optimism is good. I like it. <laughs> but we did talk actually today about alternative ideas to possibly uh, have some fun street before it gets taken care of uh, by uh, DPW doing the redos. And so BSBPA is going to work with us for maybe some alternative idea or thought on uh, Winter Festival. Yeah. We're heading into March, but obviously that's got to be still put together. That's all I have. Thank you, yeah. Trustee Coronas. Uh, My yeah. way, use your microphone. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yes, for the uh, library, you can see later on on the agenda, there's a, a request for $2,000 uh, for architect Paul Mays, and that is for him to help assist the uh, the board in the next steps, particularly in applying for grants. Good, good and close to that, if you could lose, I'm sorry. There you go, that's perfect. Um, particularly for, you know, he has a lot of uh, knowledge and experience with successful grants for uh, libraries. So I think that's um, money well spent. Um, Park and Tree Board has been very active. Um, there's going to be a potential new sign for the trail at Kelly Park, which is very, um, very nicely designed. Uh, Friends of Kato Ross uh, volunteered to, to do a design and I think it shows the trail and the features, et cetera. So uh, we're looking forward to that. Um, uh, Chair uh, Caitlin Arwana and I met with Jeff uh, to go over the tree inventory and to give him um, some direction in uh, which are the more essential trees that need to come down. Uh, one of the things the uh, Park and Tree Committee is working on recommending, uh, potentially uh, recommending to this board, is that when we remove a tree, we also remove the stump because we've got a number of unsightly stumps in the village. And um, that also allows the, the opportunity to replant. Um, Ray Otten has been very busy with a group uh, concentrating on both uh, Kelly Park and Victory Circle. And if you don't know where Victory Circle is, it's in Colonial Hills. And is a park that has basically been there, but nothing much has happened. So he's getting feedback from folks on what they would like to see up at that end of the village. And then has a whole list of things for Kelly Park. Um, so uh, we look forward to, you know, having those come out of the park and tree board. Um, the, his group is very similar, I would say, to the Friends of the Wiswall community group. Um, on Friends of Wiswall, they are working on um, bench repair. If you've been in the park, you've seen the benches are rather falling apart. So, and uh, hopefully they'll move forward with that. So that's basically all I have. Thank you. Yes, so I'll start with uh, the Arts Committee. Um, as I indicated last month, they are meeting, uh, they're separating their uh, twice a month, I can't say that, twice a month meetings. Uh, the first one's always going to be more of a business meeting, the second one's more of a creative thinking session. Um, and they, the last meeting, they, uh, last month, excuse me, they kind of outlined some, they just came up with ideas of what they might want to do for our projects. This last meeting, they took that time to kind of prioritize what they think is doable and what they might want to pursue funding um, to accomplish those projects. So they're um, going to be presenting some ideas to us to in their budget requests. Uh, so they're moving along. And um, I wanted to kind of give an update on New York Ford. I wish I had more news, but New York State is um, dragging their feet. They were supposed to announce uh, winners in uh, December, and I actually reached out to some contacts to see if we can get an idea of what's going on, and they couldn't even provide anything. So far out of the 10 regions, the uh, Regional Economic Development Committees, um, 
there's only been four announced, maybe five if I missed an email of uh, the governors, but, you know, keeping our eye out, um, I do know that speaking with other assemblymen uh, and assembly members around the state that um, their communities found out last minute, so, I mean, Crossing my fingers, still hoping for Balsam Spa to be a winner. Um, but either way, I think we had a really great start, an idea, a vision of what we might want for this community. And, um, you know, I still hope we win, but if we don't, there's a way to uh, contact uh, people and, uh, you know, kind of go forward and see how we can have a stronger application in the next round because the governor is asking for more money for new board. So that's an update for that. Treasurer's report. Go ahead, Barbara, and make sure you turn that on. We get over there. Um, Saratoga County sales tax distribution for January, which is um, covering November 1st through 30th for the village, was $115,164, which is $56 less than last January. Um, the tree grant, we received the reimbursement from the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation for tree grant expense, expenses in the amount of $23,659.29 on January 26. Um, <clears throat> the transition of payroll processing through EFBR from ADP workforce to ADP one run began with the payroll did February 1st. I worked closely with Melissa at EFBR to get her up to speed regarding the different shifts for the police department and different pay types for the DPW. Um, last week, um, payday February 8th, was a monthly payroll with a whole new set of considerations, but EF, EFBR has been rolling with it and I have confidence that they are going to be able to handle the village's unique circumstances very well. Um, there have been a few hiccups and there continue to be issues to be ironed out, especially when it comes to time reporting, punching in and out as the new system can't handle that yet. But the second week was better than the first, and EFPR has been very responsive when I bring issues to their attention. Um, budget memos and request forms, or worksheets for departments, were sent out at the end of January to all departments, boards and committees, and non-profit organizations. Department head meetings will be scheduled for February 22nd through the 24th. Um, budget workshops should be scheduled for the week of March 6th, if possible. March 6th is a Monday. Um, not a regularly scheduled board meeting. And I understand that there have been three nights of workshops in the past. If that is still the desire of the board, please provide your availability when you can, um, or any scheduling conflicts for the week of March 6th. And I'm gonna encourage the board to do that by email over the next few days. So we'll get those lined up and announced officially. If that's okay. Okay, so thank you very much. Any questions for uh, Barbara while she's up there? Hearing none. Thank you. We're going to go to old business because there are no presentations for tonight and uh, code updates is first. And uh, I will hand this microphone over to the attorney to my right or left. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, there are three, four, five, five code updates uh, going on here. Um, at this point, I have received comments and provided all comments back on the ethics code back in January 27th. Um, I'd like to hear from the board when they'd like to schedule the public hearing on that one. With respect to the sidewalk and the park, I know that that's um, fairly important because of the work that's being done to Front Street. Um, so there are a couple more changes from Trustee Baskin that needs to get in there, but the goal is to have those to the board prior to the next meeting so that at the next meeting, the public hearing can be set um, for March 13th. Um, that way, I believe the Front Street work is happening uh, the end of March, beginning of April. That way, um, that can be all set. Uh, with respect to the um, ADU, uh, in recent, uh, recent emails and through a, through a seminar I went to, um, the, the ADU might be best put off for a little bit because it's um, more important to have the comp plan adopted and then do the ADU along with short-term rentals um, because they're kind of together and it's really recommended that any, any zoning, now that you have a comp plan, at least you have a draft comp plan, any zoning changes are really kind of stayed until, not officially, but stayed until the comp plan is approved because then when you get your, your zoning change, and someone comes and challenges something under that zoning, you can always go back and say, but it was in accordance with the comp plan. Um, and I think Anna 
would uh, understand, uh, agree with that one. Um, so with respect to the comp plan, in speaking with um, uh, the folks at uh, BN, we're looking to do lead agency either on at the next meeting or on the 13th. I know we're waiting to hear back from the three, uh, the two boards and the commission um, to see what their changes are before we do lead agency, because if there's significant changes, obviously we don't want to have to redo the speaker. Um, so the hope is either the, at the 27th or the 13th, we can have that moving forward. So within the next two months, we're going to have a whole lot of laws going forward. Um, and the hope is that, you know, we can get these done so that, you know, once we get to the spring, we can move on from laws and kind of do whatever's next. Thank you for your hard work. Uh, one of the things uh, concerning the sidewalk code, especially is that in today's meeting and in general, we've been uh, sort of encouraging uh, the property owners on Front Street that if there's ever a time to redo your sidewalk, uh, we'd probably be in coordination with the work we're doing uh, with respect to the ADA ramping, et cetera, uh, so that uh, we can do a few things for them. One, uh, we have this law in place. Uh, there's a better incentive process uh, built into that that we'll have to approve outside of the law yeah, because it'll be on a fee schedule at that point or payment schedule, I guess, in this case. Uh, two, you don't want to go and redo a slab of sidewalk that we're just going to go redo ourselves because you didn't ramp it correctly or something along those lines. So uh, we encourage businesses that know that their sidewalks are in need of repair or replacement to uh, you know, reach out to DPW, have their contractor reach out to DPW, et cetera, and make sure that also that we're not creating a complete disaster scenario where five people are doing their sidewalk at once and then we really do have closed down businesses for some reason because of access issues. So it, it's a process, but at the same time, uh, this is a great time to redo sidewalk all with everything else that's going to be going on in Front Street as long as we coordinate it carefully. Um, Mayor, is there any way for us, because people might want to get this process going, and if they're planning on, you know, on Front Street redoing their sidewalk, but this sidewalk law doesn't, isn't put into effect until after they started, is there some way we can allow them to get the reimbursement for what we decide, sort of retroactive. I don't know if that's possible or not. Retroactivity is a, an attorney's least favorite word because it can create all kinds of problems. And uh, I, I, I choose not to play attorney, so here you go. Me neither. Um, <laughs> so the law is actually not going to have that in there. So um, I, I think that what I don't know if anyone's doing their sidewalks right now, but it would be really hard to say that we could retroactively apply a law. The, the Constitution doesn't like that. Um, you know, it can be done, but I wouldn't recommend it. I think at this point, that's why I'm thinking if we can get this done in the next month, um, then it'll be done and approved by the Department of State. And during that same time, you folks can come up with your fee schedule because that's going to be separate and apart from the law. Right. So I, I don't think it's something that I would really recommend doing. So if people could hold off until the law, and if we could push the law for the, you know within the next month, then we can move forward and everyone will be happy. Well, hopefully. Well, thanks. Yeah. Appreciate all your hard work on that. So uh, that is that. Thank you again for your hard work. Uh, water infrastructure updates and planning. Uh, we got not one, not two, not three, but four letters from uh, Rose from LaBerge, who is our water feasibility uh, engineering company. Uh, and I guess I let's just make a long story short here. And Sean, feel free to jump in if I'm messing anything up on this, okay? Um, so with respect to the John Street Tower, uh, they did two assessments, one for uh, renovation of the existing steel tank, one for replacement to a GFS glass fused to steel tank. Uh, for renovation, uh, which they believe could with proper maintenance last about 100 years possibly, uh, is $1.06 million. That's not including any interest that you would have to endure uh, because this probably gets stretched over 30 years on a loan uh, currently. For the new glass fused to steel tank, that's $2.78 million. Uh, and he also puts out caveats about the fact that glass fused to steel has its own set of uh, issues and concerns that he does not really suggest makes them worth more than the repair and living with the current 
tank. Uh, later on in tonight's meeting, uh, the, this is one of the pieces that uh, is listed in the uh, water sewer uh, work, uh, the loan grant uh, motion that you may have seen, uh, but this is in there. Uh, also, one thing I should point out is uh, I think we talked maybe at the last meeting, I know we talked amongst ourselves about this, but about the uh, corral uh, above the water tank. Uh, that can be uh, used to move the cell equipment up to it so that we don't have to take it down every time we need to repaint uh, or resurface that tower. Uh, our pricing for a monopole next to that water tower would be about $375,000. The corral is about $120,000 and it's work that uh, would be overseen by co some companies in terms of the plans that the cell companies would put forward for any work they'd have to do to their equipment to ensure that they're not going to be basically drilling into our tank, which is some of the issues we've had is that it exposes the inside of the tank and causes the corrosion that we've noticed. So it is something to consider it's an optional item over and above the $1.06 million. Do you want to on it? So far, go ahead. Um, yeah. I get after my review of the uh, comparative analysis, um, it uh, there there are a few things that caught my eye. Um, other than um, uh, the research I've done doesn't really um, bear out that maintenance of a glass fuse line tank um, is similar to maintenance of a steel tank um, in regards to overall cost. Uh, the other one uh, is that. Um, Typically, based on historical data and not testing, but actual real real world data, um, usually you're going to have to do some sort of um, major um, refinishing of, of a steel tank within 30 years. Um, last line tanks typically go 40 plus years without any serious overhauls. Um, that all being said, when you look at the actual difference in the numbers. And even if you factor in those maintenance differences, um, we're still looking at probably at a 40 year um, horizon, um, still spending less money maintaining a steel tank than putting in a new glass line. Um, the only advantage of a glass line would be because they are a ring assembly, that if at some point we did need to expand our supply, um, we could add things. Um, whereas obviously you're fixed with the John Street water tank, whatever its capacity will always be its capacity, whether we need more capacity or not. Um, and given the locations where more build out may happen, I don't think the John Street tank would be helpful in supplying additional water anyways. so. After looking at the analysis, which I thank LaBerge for getting to us, um, I, I got to be honest with you, I'm not sure why it took as long as it did, but I'm glad we got it. And, uh, and it, it does bear out that a rehab is going to probably be our most economical choice. Second letter was about uh, the uh, project priority list from last July, I believe it was. It was updated. February of this year uh, with some uh, bump ups in the amounts uh, because of the time that's passed up to now around $60 million over the three tiers of phases. Um, so I, these are included in the uh, agenda items uh, or attachments. So you can see these for yourself. Third letter and fourth letter kind of go together uh, because uh, in that there was the discussion uh, by Don Rhodes about the idea that a report, while could, it could be generated, essentially, it would be kind of useless right now until we uh, do some things to make ourselves loan and grant uh, worthy, more or less. Um, and he wanted to do an addendum of services for free, uh, including bid packages needing uh, to be solicited uh, or bid packages needed to solicit proposals for John Street tank renovation. Letter report to document water account expenses and income associated with outside and inside village users. 
it's been a little bit of a struggle because that all the data he's looking for is data maintained by us in due course. Uh, and then uh, there was some question as to whether or not they had actually completed the work that they were assigned to do. And in the fourth letter that came out February 9th, uh, he ran through all the tasks that were in the original RFP, I believe, and suggested that either they've been completed or would be completed uh, for the most part. Uh, so I, I don't know where the disconnect came from, where the questions ultimately landed on this. Uh, again, we got four letters, so it, a little tough to track it, uh, last week, but anybody have any thoughts on what the third and fourth letters uh, were going at there? Uh, yes, I've, I've looked at them, and I think we need to look at them carefully because there are, you know, major sections of the original proposal that are going to be deferred to an addendum, which I assume means we're not getting them now, and we're going to have to pay for them. So, you know, I think we need to look at look at those a little closer. I'd also like to um, make a comment about, you know, the poll versus corral. One of the things that um, <coughs> Uh, Don, you know, explained to me is that we are getting uh, a much lower payment for the, uh, you know, the, the rental payment for cell equipment on our towers and, um, you know, that we need to, with the uh, renegotiations that are coming up, um, you know, potentially uh, get a better deal and, you know, I think for me is that if we put what a hundred thousand dollars on to, to build a corral 120. 120 that we still end up making some money putting cell equipment on our tower or why would we even bother? In other words, it should not cost us anything and we should, you know, have a certain level of profit. He also mm -hmm. recommended that you know their contracts uh, include provision that if they go up, they pay for an inspection of, of the uh, tower and some other uh, features which should have been in our earlier contracts, but you know, would be here. He said maybe they would be willing to pay for a poll instead because then they wouldn't have to pay for inspections. He also um, mentioned that there are consultants who specialize in negotiating these contracts. So we may want to consider bringing someone like that on. Thank you. I like the consult we have. Uh, to my right, she's pretty good at uh, consulting on these contracts, like the Dish Network one we had. Uh, but uh, one thing to be aware of is that the four uh, contracts that we have involving the tower, although the Dish Network is just, uh, waiting for them to go up, I think it's in the vicinity of seventy-five to eighty thousand dollars a year. So when balanced against one hundred twenty thousand dollars, without even renegotiation, that's a fair chunk of change that is probably worth. Investing $120,000 into. Uh, I want to move on to Trumbull Rosewood Crosswalk update. Uh, Carl, if you want to take a quick uh, shot at this one in terms of what the memo you had uh, stated and um, how the next step might really involve just a practical step with respect to talking to property owners. Sure. So uh, we looked into what the legal obligations were for the village with respect to the ADA work on the crosswalk, uh, the proposed crosswalk. And the real concern was the sidewalks and what does the village own and what is the village responsible for? Because there are some places where they said, well, the right of way for the county only goes to this place and where the right of way for the village go. Um, uh, one of my real estate partners um, did uh, extensive research on this and ultimately, uh, we've determined that at this point under state law, with respect to the county, the state, and uh, village highways, uh, the village has a right of way over the entire sidewalk. Um, the village actually has the obligation to make sure those sidewalks are ADA compliant. Uh, the village does delegate that obligation to, uh, through the state law, through village law, for the maintenance and repair to the adjoining property owners, to the abutting property owners. However, Ultimately, the village has to make sure that they're ADA compliant. So with respect to this, the crosswalk issue, really at this point, the village has the right to go and do the work um, without having to go and get permission, without having to get a survey done. Now, if the village wants to, the village can get a survey done. If the village wants to, the village can speak to the property owners. 
um, with respect to uh, really that crosswalk area there. Uh, ultimately, though, the village is not required to do so. We looked into this because we wanted to make sure that the village wasn't infringing <coughs> anybody's property rights. And there was concern because nobody seems to know well, where does the village is right away and where does the, the village is right away is, is the sidewalk, period. And the, the sidewalk is, is um, maybe owned by someone, village has the right of way. So the village, you know, it's an abundance of caution to say, go ahead and get a survey, go ahead and talk to the property owners. Um, but the local municipality has a right and an obligation to construct and maintain the sidewalks and to make them ADA compliant. So with that stated, uh, I'm going to seek permission here uh, to the degree possible to uh, instruct uh, LaBella to revise their fee schedule for this project so we can vote on it at the next meeting and reach out if we can determine the property owners and the either side of the street just to discuss with them uh, more or less a permission or a thumbs up to do the work. Uh, that needs to be done just out of that amount of caution that Carla spoke about and just kind of straw poll showing that okay on your part. Yeah, yeah, that that sounds like basically what I've heard in the past is, uh, you know, the sidewalk is the sidewalk and we were, we're able to make modifications to it. Um, as far as New York State DOT goes about the permit application, um, they don't really get into the right of way issues. That's the individuals, so that should impede them approving the application. Liz and Bernard, that go ahead. Um, yeah, I mean, if, if we've determined that it's our right of way, I, I think you know it's of course courtesy to inform those landowners that this work, just like you have done with the front street businesses, that this work will be uh, done and. You know, that's that's basically it. And I think most of the work is the ADA ramps, right? Which is really towards the crosswalk, not, you know, the whole width of the sidewalk. Um, and uh, just as related to all this talk about ADA, uh, we'll be uh, uh, approving the ADA um, uh, advisory committee tonight and uh, getting going on that work. Um, we've got a good group. And uh, what this group will be doing is the plan for the village going forward um, to, to make our sidewalks and crosswalks and other um, the features in the right of way ADA compliant. And it all ties together. Nicely. And Bernadette, you okay with the, that idea of how to move this forward? <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, as much as it's our right, it's always good to build those relationships with our residents. So, absolutely. Thank you very much. We go up, uh, skip up to public comment. Five minutes per speaker. Please raise your hand in house if you want to speak. Come on up to the podium and uh, turn on the microphone. Speak into it if you'd like to. Michael. Nice and easy. See that? <laughs> that I can do. Thank you, uh, Mike. I glued you nine Muscle Street. Um, just two things, if I could ask one or more of you to respond to following public comment. Uh, first, in the attachments to tonight's meeting, there was a listing of expenditures seemingly for the first month or six weeks of the year. Um, most of those entries showed a payee and a purpose and a amount. Uh, there was one entry, one line item entry for approximately $1,800 with a notation for flags, but I could not determine a payee. So if you could explain what the flags were and to whom the payment went, that would be appreciated. Uh, the second thing is Woods Hollow. There is a lot of <laughs> gossip, scuttlebutt, going around the community about Woods Hollow. And it would be helpful to me, certainly, if we could just hear what the status of Woods Hollow is and what the plans or expectations for that property are. Thank you. Do you have any idea in the flags part, uh, Barbara, before I jump in? We'll check into that, Mike, and get back to you on that then. Make sure that we have that. So any of us uh, have it right off the end. Hey, if you want to, go ahead. Um, Barbara's going to go run that down for you. 
See that? Thank you, Barbara. <laughs> this might be an excuse to escape the building. <laughs> With respect to what's how, I just want to, uh, this good uh, question. We're going to actually uh, be uh, having some discussion amongst ourselves about that as well later on tonight. So uh, rest assured that there's a lot more to be heard about this down the line. But as you remember, probably from uh, attendance meetings uh, back last year, we identified that the forest had not been tended to in terms of uh, the uh, selective cutting process, which is really not the correct action, but that's kind of the short term for uh, people uh, in that process. Forest management, I guess that's what they call it. Forest management. Uh, it hadn't been done in decades. Uh, and so in trailing back into the history of Woods Hollow, we did find the resolution where the village uh, determined to make it forever wild, essentially, in forest and Milton would be maintaining it in that whole life. Uh, Milton is at that point where they're saying, hey, we don't want to maintain it anymore, and so it's going to be a new village. The village is basically saying, hey, how many of us in the village actually use it? It's pretty much all Milton folks using it, so what do we do? And so they expressed an interest to buy it from uh, the village, but there's a process that you have to go through for that type of situation. Plus, we wanted to also take care of the trees in the meantime. So we uh, put it out to a few different companies. We got two bids back on the work uh, being done in terms of uh, actually it's a profit to the village ultimately because of the lumber uh, that's involved. Uh, one firm just left a bad taste in my mouth because they seem to be going after all the most valuable wood in the process. And I, I just felt like they were going to clear cut certain areas just to get that wood and see you later type of situation. Didn't like it. We landed on Lumac, and Bob Rice uh, is one of their principals uh, who uh, has had affiliation with Milton, with that forest, and really seemed to care about the forest and really walking us through everything in the process. Uh, over the months of last year, we went back and forth to make sure that the contract uh, was acceptable. Uh, it was about a $70,000 uh, expectation to the village at that point in time. And we signed the contract in November, give or take, of last year. The anticipation was that the work would be done in the winter because you want to do it when the ground is hardest uh, to protect the ground as things may get dragged uh, inside the forest for whatever reason. So fast forward, we we're prepped to do the work. Milton's getting calls, supposedly. I was getting calls on my cell phone. Generally, every call I got on my cell phone uh, was appeased by the reassurance of talking about everything that's going on offered to uh, send them over to Bob Rice, who's been explaining to several people in the forest or by email or whatever, uh, why so many blue marks were on trees. And the answer really is, it was a lot denser and deader in that respect than expected. And so about one in six of uh, the trees that are 10 inches in diameter or greater would come down under that process. Uh, the blue marks you see, a couple areas he's doing what's called prescription which is he'll lay out the ground rules for the company that'll be doing the cutting and work with them on determining specifically which ones. He just didn't mark them individually in the same way. So uh, we went and we talked to Milton and uh, we appeared at their last uh, meeting in December, their only meeting in December of last year. And Bob was there, I was there, reassured folks there and thought we were pretty good to go with respect to that. So without the snow and with some of the elements, it really hasn't formed hard ground completely at certain times until around that minus 15 degree day spell we had that probably finally got them into a better spot. So the plan is to do the cutting in late February. In the meantime, we get a, a offer letter from Milton. I will not go into specifics uh, out of courtesy here, but more or less they sent an appraisal that we looked at and we had some concerns about and they sent an offer price, which we had concerns about. And we also had the point of view of, we signed a contract and we can't really get out of that contract because it, it's work to be done. They had to set aside their time that all this marking of trees, et cetera. Okay. So what we did do was talk to Lumac to make them aware of the situation, to see if they had any interest in perhaps terminating and what we learned in the meantime is that because of all the density 
of the trees to be taken down, that $70,000 number and also value of lumber has gone up at least at the market value that they would be achieving uh, to a point where it's $168,000 to the village now, not $70,000. This does not mean that they're clear cutting anything. It's not that, again, it's density that's really been the culprit in there and a lot of sideways growth and things that are not positive inside the forest atmosphere. So where I can leave you on this story for now is that there are discussions between Milton and Balsam Spa and Lumac because it has to be a three-way discussion at this point with respect to what to do here. And from there, we have to make some determinations as a board what to do because again, we are in a contract with Lumac. I hope that answers uh, your questions as to where we are. Uh, I, can't, can, I can't give you any guesses on where we go from here beyond saying we do have a contract with LUMAC that they expect to be cutting in late February, unless something changes. Mm -hmm. Anybody else in the house? Yes, sir. If you can, yep. Baby. Don't forget your name John and address. Hello, you got it. 38 Washington Street. Thank you. It's been a while since I've been here, but I had some health issues. Um, I, I received an email that, that discussed um, the possibilities of finding new places, new residences for some of the departments in the village. And that the, the, the issue that was raised was that the, the decisions to, or the shopping for this property was not being shared with the other members of. Uh, Board. Is, there, is there any plan to include the entire board in the process, or you're just going to keep it down to one or two individuals? You no, know, I, I think what you're keep, uh, hearing about, or maybe seen on Facebook, and I actually answered on Facebook to give the details, is uh, Mayor's Advisory Group to get uh, folks like local developers and the people that utilize the buildings involved, police court and DPW. To, to start doing some investigation, to look at different possibilities, uh, answers and sites, and report back to the board with their evaluation of ideas, et cetera. So nobody's making decisions over there, they're just doing an evaluation of uh, things once we get that together. So everyone's included in the evaluation. Okay. Um, the, um, I, I, I noticed there's an extreme use of fuel or waste by the fire department. So I live right across the street. And last week, the one, of the one of the trucks ran for almost an hour, just over an hour, because the engine ran. And I don't understand why it's either idling for over an hour. Is it? So by last, was it last weekend? Yeah. So when it was 20 below, yeah. Yeah, the, if they're diesel, they're going to have to keep them on like so the fuel won't gel. Okay. Just questioning because it seemed excessive to me. And uh, last thing, um, I, I think I brought this up once before. It, it, we, we have a flag, an American flag, on, on the fire chief's offices over there. And the idea of the flag is to, to be lit, and it's not. And it should come down the sunset. Because Ukraine's flag is lit, I see 24 7. So, what about our own? Oh, that's shit, I'll take a look at that one actually. You're talking about the one that goes off? The one, no, the one that's right. Uh, Side. That's lit. Uh, about the uh, fire chief's office. Okay, I'll take it. I'll look at it. Thank you very much. Sure. So, they were going to do a flag by Dunkin' Donuts and all of you there at one point. And that was one of the issues I raised. It. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, back to you, Mike Icolucci. Uh, display sales is the vendor uh, that the $1,820 for flags uh, was attributed, attributed to right here. So thank you. And thank you to Barbara. Uh, you, you didn't run away. You came back. <laughs> Anybody else in the house? Ray, if you just want somebody to pass that over to you, you do what you want. It's on Velcro, so you can pull it off. You can take it right off. Yep. That one. 
You hear me? Right? We can. Yes. Right out in 16 Middlebrook Avenue. Middlebrook? Okay. Yeah, just want to make sure you got that. Um, <laughs> Uh, a couple of things, um, just wanted to let everybody know that on March 2nd uh, at the uh, VFW on West North. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> just wanna make sure it's West and not, yeah. yeah. On West North, the uh, Rotary will be having from three to 6 p.m. a chicken barbecue, uh, Burke's barbecue. And uh, it's a $15 uh, charge for that. And if you go to our website, which is balsonrotary.com, you can uh, pre-order and uh, help support Rotary with all of its uh, sundry different donations and that. So we'd appreciate anybody coming to that that could. Um, Liz mentioned the uh, Kelly Park group uh, that I'm trying to work with. And we're going to be having our second meeting, either the 22nd or the 28th. I'm, I'm confirming a location right now to have it. Last time we had about 12 people and my kitchen was full. I have no more room. <laughs> so I wanted to get something a little bigger. And I'm working on that now. If you, you contact me through Facebook, that's the easiest way. Let me know you're coming. And then we'll know, uh, you know exactly when we're going to have it, probably by the end of Thursday, I would say. Uh, but I'm looking for input from people what they're available for and all that to come. Is this Millie's uh, excuse for a bigger house? Uh, no. <laughs> she wants me to just move out. <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, third thing I have was I, I was told that this year uh, we're looking at possibly replacing the steps that lead up from Front Street up to the Tedesco Trail. I guess there's a lot of rot and things like that coming into that set of stairs, which makes it dangerous. Um, what I'm proposing is that we, instead of just replacing the stairs, that we make that ADA accessible, since it is accessible from the other end over on Prospect Street, if we could make a ramp system going up to that level, uh, then it would be accessible on both ends to those of us that ride around on buggies and walk with crutches and all that good stuff in wheelchairs. And we might be able to solicit some funds from the guy that is named after. Uh, you know, he might be able to hook us up with some state money that might help us to do that. But if we're putting X amount of dollars into new steps, could we put in X plus to put in a ramp system and make it fully accessible? It would also help those people that live uh, up on top of the hill if they wanted to come down, take the trail over and into our downtown area. It would make it much more accessible. Just a thought. Reach out to me. We'll uh, reach out to Adam Kramer in his office and see maybe if we can get something on that end too. Yeah. Um, one of the other things that, that uh, Liz mentioned was the uh, ADA group. And thank you, first of all, for including me in that. And <laughs> Uh, I wanted to uh, just question a little bit about the bus stops. I, I know uh, there had been some conversation pertaining to the bus stop in the midst of downtown at uh, Malta Avenue, which uh, and now I've sort of made it a cause for myself to go there and watch. And it does usually go through at least two turns of the light uh, when it's loading any more than one or two passengers, especially if somebody has a bike or walk or something like that. Um, again, a suggestion would be to move it or actually eliminate those two bus stops as at Malta Avenue. Bus stops, I almost said that. Uh, and just use the existing ones that are at the bottom of the hill across from Hamilton Street and at the top of the hill right outside here. They already have bus stops there. All the inconvenience would be with those people that would normally get on there, they would have to walk an extra two blocks. And that would allow an area that the bus could actually pull over and be a designated bus stop on either side of the street. Uh, if they do it right next to the Elks Club uh, driveway on, on Milton Avenue, there's enough space there. There's three or four parking spots there. And then right across the street from it on the other side. And then you're not involving any of the parking that would be eliminated here that they talked about in the middle of uh, Malton and Milton. I, I just think it would work and it would alleviate some of the traffic problems that we are encountering all the time, or at least in the last 40 years I've been here. Uh, it just continues. 
So again, just a suggestion. And Ray, one thing I, I, I had that discussion with Megan Quirk over at CTTC, and they're of the belief that that problem doesn't exist. That it is right. I heard that. Yeah, instant. Uh, you know, pull through maybe one light at the most. And uh, as I had suggested to her, I'd watch it when I got my hair cut. We're used to uh, dine at Nomad. Uh, I would watch it out there. So maybe it's worth getting some emails and letters together just to emphasize that they take a deeper, closer look at that because realistically it is the problem you're stating for what I've I seen mean, too. You know, maybe that would be a good study <laughs> to do um, and actually get some numbers that, that are real and not just imagined. Because like I say, I have sat there. You wanted to? No, I was gonna wait for the public okay. comments. Uh, last thing I had, I hope everybody has heard with sadness uh, about Turkey and the earthquake that happened over there. I think the last time I heard was 28,000. It's in the 30s. It's in the 30s now. 28, all right, say 30,000 people died. Um, I'm hoping that they had their equivalent of FEMA training. <laughs> Liz is laughing because she knew I couldn't get through a meeting without bringing that up. FEMA training is important. This could happen here. There's a fault line. There's flooding. There's huge storms. We need to get that that done. I know, Carla, you had that somebody had said that you were looking into that. I, I, I did, and I sent all the information to the board members. So I think they were in the process of setting that up. Okay, I appreciate that. I, you know, again, I just want us to all be safe. That's all there is. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Ray. Anybody else in the house? Uh, up front first, or Jared, I think Mark's first, yeah. Oh, go ahead, Mark. Uh, Mark Black, 10 Thompson Street. Uh, I just want to remind everyone that we're having a meeting on the 23rd of this month, February, to talk about Family Fun Day and the Birdhouse Program. Everybody's welcome to attend. Uh, we're just going to talk about what we're planning and what uh, any suggestions, you know, concerns and all that. So if anyone would like to join us, it's 6.30 here in the library, right? Yeah, so, um, and then I, uh, I listened to the thing on, fa on Facebook today, the Zoom. Uh, it seems like a lot of good ideas. My concern was who's gonna be doing the regular village maintenance while DPW is tearing up the street? I mean, it seems like that's a huge project. and. Uh, usually they're very busy in the, in the spring anyway. So who's going to be doing that sort of work? Uh, and while I really support Front Street and all the businesses there, um, they're, you know, 10 people, 10 businesses versus 5,278 of the rest of us that need services. Um, the plan to, uh, you know, to uh, support the business while it's happening, the, I know the Arts Committee is planning, uh, talked about doing uh, chalking the pavement, uh, but we are gonna be putting up 10,000 birdhouses and new banners. And I wish you guys had included us in this conversation because uh, one, we have a contract with you guys to do it and which we need to keep that line of communication open. And the other thing is uh, we, have a, we have commitments to people that we get money from so as to meet their requ their requirements. So I wish there was a, I wish we were involved in that. So that, uh, you know, I mean, are we gonna be able to put birdhouses this year? Jeff talked about not having, not being able to do it, uh, that there's a possibility that it will go after January 1st. Right now we're planning to move the birdhouse. June um, 1st, you mean? June. June 1st, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> we're planning to have a birdhouse festival June 10th. Is that going to be possible or isn't? Is it? You know, should we move it into July and then what happens with Family Fun Day? All these things about bringing people into the village. So we're trying to promote the village too. I, I just wish we were a part of that discussion. Um, are the I was told also that there are trolley tracks under the street. Are they going to be removed? Are there trolley tracks? Is that going to, I mean, what happens if we, what, what happens if we find, you know, who knows what under there? It's been 200 years since a lot of it has been done. Um, you know, so those are my questions. I mean, will, when will we be able to hang stuff? 
And will if we hang them in May, will will they be in the way of the construction um, that's going on? So again, these these are things that I would tell you to coordinate directly with Jeff because he'll know what the work entails better than I can sit here and tell you. My my guess sitting here, kind of spitballing here, is that where you're going to hang birdhouses will not have any effect on the work that they need to do uh, because ultimately they're going to be doing storm structures, pieces of sidewalk at the crosswalks uh, or the areas that will be crosswalk areas and mill and fill. Uh, with respect to the other question you asked, they're milling an inch and a half off the pavement. So they would have found uh, those tracks by now for what their work is that they're going to do on the street itself for mill and fill purposes. So that's not the uh, worry. I, sometimes when they mill, uh, they'll find uh, a couple minor things that they want to take care of. And that's why they'll mill probably one week on a Monday and then do any work that they find they have to do. So you'll have a rough road for a week and then fill and stripe the next week and hopefully on a Monday, in a Monday when there's the least traffic going on out there. With respect to, though, in general, your ideas of uh, the birdhouse is going up and everything else, we're trying to make sure that A, and DPW uh, coverage. DPW has coverage for everything it needs to do uh, or they need to do over there on top of this. So that's why it's a nine week schedule ultimately that we're looking at because they're aware that they will have other things to do during that time. So this is not the exclusive thing they're doing. We're also talking to them about ensuring anybody that's gonna try to burn vacation days because they're getting to the end of the time they can use them to work with them to perhaps move them to uh, later on in the year or to pay out uh, with board approval ultimately in something like that so that we make sure we're staffed. Remember, this was supposed to be taken care of maybe in the fall, this street with no real pre-planning. And you can see what a huge undertaking it's becoming because of everything involved with it. So it's good that we have moved it and it's good that we're centralizing it into a manageable scenario right now village so that it doesn't affect businesses and events and everything that will begin to crop up when school basically ends, uh, give or take, uh, in June. So we're working with that. We're trying to make sure that we can do whatever we can to move up the end date from May 31st, which was kind of the cutoff end date that we've been talking about, to something a couple weeks earlier, if possible. And because of the weather, the way it is right now, they're going to attack some of the storm structures that they're already aware needs uh, to be handled starting in the next week to two weeks, well before the end of March. This is just more subtle work that they'll do to get a head start on it in the idea of getting it done. Can I just interject? I'm sorry about arts. Um, the last that we discussed, I know it was mentioned on the, the Zoom today, uh, arts committee had evaluated what they thought they could accomplish. I'm not sure that they they left it at the last meeting that they didn't think that they could necessarily accomplish this sort of art project before all the work was done because of the weather, because of concerns of safety. So if anything does change, Mark, I'll reach out to you so we can, like you said, communicate better. And I, I, I don't right. disagree with that. So Yeah, we're just planning a lot right now. Yeah. We need to figure out whether it's going to happen at all. You know, it's, uh, you know, we have to make commitments. Um, I'm sorry, let's go on. Liz? No, I was just going to remind folks that we were going to save our comments after the public. Well, oh, we're, move, we're moving along well tonight, so we want to be a little more interactive. Go, go. Go. Anyway, uh, Jared, I think you're going to Good evening. Uh, just a couple of things. Um, name, name and address though first. Yes, Jared Aglucci, 24 Chapman Street. Um, just want to comment first on the length of the agenda. It's nice to see that we have a manageable agenda this evening. Um, I'm hopeful that that means any business that may have been controversial had been settled in communication prior to the meeting as, as I think has been raised several times in the meeting before. Um, but my main reason for speaking is I just wanted to comment on the comprehensive plan. I understand there's a quick path forward and a desire to get this, uh, get this fully done as quickly as possible. Um, just one note on that is that as our comprehensive steering committee that has now disbanded reviewed uh, the material in a little more depth over the holiday, 
it became apparent we didn't have clear goals regarding transportation sections that were discussed uh, pretty in depth in our planning. So I just wanna call that out as multiple members have expressed interest in trying to add that language in. I know we have a process moving forward here, but I wanna make sure that those are addressed as we saw them as, as critical pieces of planning for the future. And that's all. And, and Jared, let me reassure you that one of the reasons why we didn't want to fast forward on seeker work, et cetera, as Carl had mentioned I think earlier, was we are aware that there was that part and there may be other things that crop up that we might either want to take a look at ourselves or ask for some assistance from the committee. So instead of rushing through work that will have to get done again by us, we're just trying to let the process for this first part go through and then take a look and say, OK, well, we need to add, fix, et cetera. Yeah, it makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for your work and uh, all the uh, committee's work as well on that. As we uh, say quite often. Uh, anybody else in the house? Yes, Christine. My fellow basketball buddy. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, Christine Kernikin, Vice President of Boston Spa Business and Professional Association. Uh, first, I just want to say thank you for setting up that Zoom meeting today. Some of the feedback we've been hearing from our business members is the key to uh, keeping people on is communicating, right? The, the businesses really want to know timelines and communication. So the more communicating you can do with the business members and, and residents um, on Front Street, some of the key things that they are concerned with is being able to communicate to their clients any other types of, of accessibility issues for people getting in and out of their businesses, as well as when they're planning for their inventory and, and whatnot. So the more communications you can have out to them, um, the better they would appreciate that. Also just wanted to share, um, we just recently had the first Friday Chocolate Fest mm -hmm. and thank you uh, Trustee Cormos and and Dense and our mayor for attending on the most frigid night of the year. Um, okay. Part of the plan that, that we talked with the village about last year, as far as marketing the village is really, uh, it's really exploded and we're getting so much feedback from people who are coming into town saying they saw this on Facebook and they saw it on Instagram and they're seeing things all over. So uh, just wanna say thank you for that. Um, it was a very successful event and uh, we look forward to being able to share more of those events and continuing with the marketing partnership. So thank you. Christina, I neglected to say earlier that uh, tomorrow we'll be pushing that meeting recording up to YouTube uh, when Jennifer's back in the office this meeting up tonight and the meeting from earlier today on, uh, to the village's YouTube as well. So let your membership know. Okay, will do. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else in the house? Anybody on Zoom? Give you a half second because I probably should have warned you ahead of time. I'm a little bit congested, so I'm not going to try to sing a song to pass the time by or anything for you folks. I see none. And so Going once, going twice. Forward comments, questions, concerns. Well, I just want to address the uh, concern on the CDPA. They're going to bring in a consultant and go through a process and with public comment, they've assured us that. So um, there may even be other closer um, spots. Uh, there's, a, I believe, a piece of land at the end of the, the block, um, you know, between East and West High, but actually close to Front Street. And that might be a spot to explore as well for, for a bus, bus stop and wouldn't require folks to go uphill, which can be difficult for some, some of the people using the bus. So um, they'll take, you know, public comment and they have engineers who do this all the time. So. We're, we're hoping that uh, it comes out to you know, something that we want. Um, I wanted to uh, speak to uh, Jared's. I'm not going to try to make sure this thing. Just go with I. Okay. Um, uh, in regards to the comp plan, I do want to thank you guys. You guys did tremendous work. Um, and um, I'm glad you're considering, you know, looking at it to make modifications for transportation. Um, I would add that um, you may be able to consolidate some of it as well because you have 
bikeways and pedestrians, which are also considered modes of transportation. Um, so you may be able to kind of consolidate that in all one section. Um, and uh, uh, the comment regarding uh, Ray's concerns, um, they, uh, <clears throat> they will do what's called a capacity analysis as part of the study. And they'll take into account traffic volumes, buses per hour, and there's a set of empirical data and formulas they go through to find out what, what the level of services and the level of services are rated, much like everybody was rated in school, A through F, and, uh, and we'll see you know, where it lands. Um, my biggest concern there was if they did do, you know, took some of the parking there, to make like a bus turnout, um, would that impede through movements? Because right now people kind of go around a left turn if they're queued to go down, I think it's Washington. Um, if that doesn't happen, that's typically when you see the huge queues of vehicles is because somebody's trying to take a left turn and they through movements can't really get, get around them. Um, uh, but um, in regards to buses, uh, you know, there's like maybe one bus every 30 minutes. I don't know. The real issue with that corridor is there's a lot of traffic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, but obviously, as Liz said, with this study, um, we'll find out you know, if, if they can do something there and still accommodate their traffic. Just, just to um, touch on that, I know one of the things that both Sean and I asked for was a forward looking sort of analysis because I mean, this area is growing, I said it last time. And um, regardless, I think we should have, take a very careful look at that. And if there are other options that work, I'd love to hear them. Um, but yeah, so I think for all of us, we are, you know, we are thinking about that. And as far as BSBP, yeah, I can't believe I didn't mention chocolate fest. It was amazing. And we ate too much chocolate. And uh, it was just a really wonderful night. And, you know, um, I'm very congratulations to you guys. You did a wonderful job. I think I finally thawed out from it, to be honest with you. Chocolate was absolutely delicious. No, it was. Every piece was delicious. Who knew that vegan chocolate dishes could be so good, by the way? Yeah, I was surprised today, pleasantly so. Kind of get a motion that the attached budget transfer be approved. Uh, Trustee Pondain, Pondain, sir. Second. Trustee Raymond, discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Can I get a motion that the library be authorized to retain architect Paul Mays at a cost of $2,000, approximately 12 hours of service? I'll make that motion. Trustee Cormos. Trustee Fundain said discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Can I get a motion that the following projects be pursued for funding and grants over the next five years? 1A 1, Geyser Road Well Generator. 1A 2, John Street Water Tank Rehabilitation. 1A 3, Colonial Hills Tank and Rowan Street Tank. Rehabilitation. 1B-1, Water Leak Protection Survey. 1B-2, Inflow Infiltration I&I &I Evaluation. 1C-1, Water Service Meter Replacement. 1C-2, Water Valve Replacements. 1D-1, Chester Lewis Utility Improvement. 1D-2, Columbia Avenue Utility Improvement. 1E-1, McLean Street. And 1E-2, McMaster Street Projects. I'll make that motion. motion. I think Sean just beat you out there, Liz. So we'll give it to Trustee Raymond. I'll second. Trustee Carmos, discussion. Just a quick question. So um, what are we going to do to take Don's suggestion to, to really prepare ourselves to actually qualify for funding? You know, I think certainly all of us want to see these projects pursued and taken care of. But... Um, I think we really need to start addressing that because if we're not going to, I don't know, Frank. Can you can you can you indicate whether? Well, I, I'm wrong on that, or I, I'm, I'm just looking at the uh, list. It's basically, what this 
motion does is takes the, the entire phase one, which is on this chart that I was uh, talking about earlier that's in the uh, materials. Yeah. And apparently says we're going to do all these in the next five years, which has a phase one subtotal of $14 million. $865,800, which may not be fully true because John Street tank rehabilitation is probably about $800,000 less. So let's call it $14 million. 30% contingency would be about 4.2, if that's the case. And that leaves $18 million of, uh, in five years. And so I think you have a very legitimate question with respect to what are we doing to make sure that we're not putting that entire bill because the loans that can be generated for these have to be based on the useful life of everything. In some cases, that's 30 years. In some cases, that's 20 years, depending on, on what we're talking about. And so it's a lot of money, no doubt. It's just a question of what's the pathway to lessen the pain, the most possible way uh, out there. And I know that from my communications with Don, generally, uh, he's been uh, pushing us on the well generator question because he feels like some of that could be handled in-house. Uh, John Street uh, tank rehabilitation, the Colonial Hills and Rowland Street rehabilitations also for the simple reason that uh, right now that's about $500,000 of work. And about six years ago, he indicated that uh, from what he could see, that's the John Street tank was about a $300,000 project about six years ago. Now it's $1.06 million. And by not doing that work, that's what happened there. So he's saying, do the Colonial Hills and the Rolling Street tanks now because you don't want that same circumstance to haunt you later on. Uh, he did not mention anything else right now because he has the concern that you raised or that about priming ourselves to be loan and grant worthy. Mm -hmm. This is one of those don't shoot the messenger moments to the trustees said just conveying what my conversation with this with non events since these letters got generated. So we jump down and you should, should we maybe prioritize these with Don? I mean, I, mean, I, th I think Don prioritized these correctly. Um, I think they're, I remember this is over a, you know, a four or five year period, um, at which point, I don't know, I assume at some point, that he's going to do some grant applications probably in 2024 um, and hopefully you receive some of these. Um, again, um, from my understanding from talking with Don in past meetings, um, committing to this doesn't mean that we're obligated to fund all of this, even if we were to um, take a bond for the entire amount. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to spend that bond um, and, or use all of it, um, particularly if at some point we get grants. Um, that was my understanding. Uh, I would say uh, 1B1 and 1B2 are going to be invaluable in trying to obtain grants mm -hmm. because that's actually gonna tell us what is wrong and how bad it is. Um, uh, same thing with 1B1. Um, I think they're, they're important because we can't put an RFP out for any sort of design work until we have that information. So I think my concern is the word pursued. I, I'm not sure what that really means with respect to this. And if it more or less makes it more of a mandatory must do, or and that's where I'm, I'm Maybe the lawyer would be thinking too hard on this, but that, that was my concern when I saw this. He said, uh, pro the following projects be pursued for funding and grants. It may be something considered uh, or planned for funding and grants or something along those lines that at least says there's a planning process that we'll enter into instead of jumping out and doing them. But we still have some ability to consider them down the line to make sure that we're not for a village that's got a budget of $6 million, give or take, we are basically saying, hey, here's five years worth of projects uh, worth $18 million, which is three years of our entire budget. Uh, so that, that's where I get a little bit squeamish about this after my, uh, my conversations with Don, but I, I am open to thoughts on that wording, I guess, is my uh, question mark. Well, the pursuit is the funding and grant, not the project. So but if 
Carla has a better term that, that we put in there. I also would like to ask a question. Um, uh, are we still here? Um, <laughs> how much ARPA money do we still have left? Because um, I think a good use for ARPA money would be those surveys, um, the water leak protection and the inflow invitation. Um, it's allowed to use ARPA money for those purposes. Uh, you're not likely to get grant money for, for the study. You want to do the study and then it makes you qualify for the grant. So I'd like to you know if we can um, get an update on we still have our funds, I believe. We do. And uh, we have used some of them for around $30,000 to the Front Street uh, underground work uh, was our money. We as of current, and I have a funny feeling it's going to get kicked uh, by, uh, by administration. I think we have to utilize uh, ARPA funds by the end of this calendar year, but I have a feeling a lot of municipalities are going to ask for extended half, and we'll see where it goes, but just keep that in the back of your minds so we can check on exactly where we land on ARPA or where we have landed on ARPA at this point. As a suggestion, I think we can say, pursue funding and grants for the following projects rather than pursue following projects. Just to clarify what we're doing, just- Works for me. So okay. what, could you uh, say that, Ella, for- Sure, so the change I'm suggesting is that we say, um, you know, the first and second, that the following, um, uh, that, excuse me, that funding is pursued, funding and grants are pursued for the following projects. Just an order yeah. change. With yeah. So over the next five years? Sure. So I just want to make sure that that's your intention. Okay, that was the trustee Raymond Barely. I think you got it first on that, so. Yeah, I, I right. agree to that amendment. And trustee Cormos in the second? Uh, agrees to it. So now uh, with the revised motion, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Can I get a motion uh, that the ADA Transition Plan Advisory Committee be formed with the following members? Ed Martin, Nathan Ward, Ray Otten, Dana Wilmer, Katie Tiedemann, Robert Wiltsey, Colby Crow, and Sandra Cross. Members have completed community interest form forms as required by our committee policy. The grant funded project will be led by Carrie Ward, Senior Transportation Planner of the Capital District Transportation Council, Liz Cormos, Village Trustee, with assistance of the planning and engineering firm, LaBella Associates. Apologize for not having requested by Trustee Cormos at the end of that. I'll make that motion. The aforementioned Trustee Cormos and Trustee Raymond on the second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Made a motion creating the position of part time accounting clerk for an hourly rate and overall payment that does not exceed the appropriated amount for the remainder of the current fiscal year based on the date of fire of $24,000. Adjusting that annual amount by percentage increase or decrease that is consistent with the budgeted increases or decreases of village offices staff generally for future fiscal years. Position's maximum number of hours per week will be 19 hours. Trustee Fundane side. I'll second. Trustee Raymond, discussion. Um, I cannot vote on this because I'll have to abstain because we have not even received a job description for this position. And we have requested job descriptions for village hall staff. We just requested a job description for this proposed position and qualifications, et cetera. And we did so um, myself, uh, Trustee Raymond and Trustee Baskin um, requested these over the last week, multiple times, have not received it. So I can't make a decision on a position I have no job description or rationale for. As the kids would say, that's cap, uh, because you did receive it on Friday morning uh, once Jennifer got back in and I was able to send over hers. Uh, so I'm not sure what you mean by that. On Friday morning, we sent annotated versions because obviously the job descriptions have changed over time. And so we wanted to show what is and isn't being done and then annotate it further with additional tasks. So you had those and we provided them. Uh, and then you had a full time to discuss with Barbara, Terry, myself, uh, and others about this uh, position. I received 
uh, a job description that covered both treasurer and deputy treasurer and budget officer. It didn't cover just the treasurer. Uh, it was a very long job description, one for the administrator and uh, one, one for the um, account system. I think it's deputy clerk, et cetera. Deputy, no, it's not deputy. And she's receptionist at deputy clerk. Is it deputy clerk? I'm not sure. It's part of it, yes. Okay. So um, we received those, but I received no job description for this proposed project, a uh, proposed position. None. Barbara, how can I, how can somebody approve a position with no description of what that position does? Barbara, would you like to address uh, your ideas for this job in terms of being able to write up a description related to it? I don't have anything prepared. That's fine. Um, but I had some notes that I had. Um, hold on. I'm sorry. It's on a note on my phone. And remember, every job description will end up having other duties as needed. So, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Trust me, that's what my meter top description says. <laughs> All right. I'm sorry. I don't You're actually, fine. I don't know if I. What? Okay, actually, I do. <laughs> I Go have some it. notes. Um, it's not a job description, um, but some notes that I thought would be good to have someone in the front of the office taking care of on a weekly <laughs> basis, um, such as payroll coordination. Um, depending on availability, cash receipts, um, taking things to the, I might still take things to the bank, but preparing the cash receipts, um, the retirement reporting, that would be a responsibility of that position, in my opinion, um, possibly the payroll journals. I know it's a part-time position, so I'm not sure like how we might have to figure that out. Who's going to do that? I do that now. I do all this stuff now. Um, union dues, deferred comp checks, those are all weekly things that have to go out. Um, the online payment batches are kind of, um, they come in every day and if someone makes a payment to the wrong town, which has happened, you can't really do anything about it unless you catch it immediately, you can't reject it. Um, so someone who could be on top of that every day, um, um, assist with a manual um, because we don't currently have one. Um, and assist with other duties, um, large accounts, breakdowns for um, the payables um, to help Trish, who would be, who would be entering them still, um, but to help with the larger accounts. Those are the thoughts I had. Well, I do appreciate that, Barbara, but I know um, I'm a big fan of written documentation, and this isn't your issue. Um, we should have been provided it. Um, and uh, um, all that sounds great, um, you know, for, for the position and understandable. And uh, um, I mean, I have some more comments, not necessarily addressed, okay. but uh, I do feel that at this point in time, there's probably a need for an additional person. Um, the big thing that it sounds to me what we really truly need here is um, some help with training to allow Barbara to get up to speed. And I know that that was something that we were going to get through our current accountant, but based on information I heard, um, they're having staffing issues. So we're having issues getting training. Um, so I do think at some point when you get the full training and then other members of the staff get their full training that I don't think, I think this position will be superfluous. So what I propose is making an amendment to this motion that we set a term of six months and then reevaluate to see if this continued help is needed um, and it also sets a good uh, deadline for getting the training that you so you requested and you need um, to get up to speed and to do, you know, I, I looked at your job description and um, 
I was kind of blown away by the massive amount of work associated with your job description. Um, what I saw typically, you know, and doing a little research in other villages represents the bulk of the work that any village hall does. So um, I'm finding it difficult and, you know, to understand why we essentially have five people, which is a few more people than almost any other village of a similar size has. Um, and we haven't had better allocation of tasks. So, um, and I think that, you know, also part of it, um, these job descriptions would be something that HR would just have on file, boom, and throw out. And um, what we receive, I, I actually discussed with an HR professional, and these aren't job description. Um, so we need to work on that. Um, and I would also recommend that part of the six month period that maybe we need to outsource HR so that we can, you know, if we don't already, um, but maybe completely outsource it um, so we can get all of these things up to date. I know it's Frank walked into this, this is the way it's been. Um, but now that it's been discovered, well, we need to take care of it. And I think it'll benefit you um, and it'll benefit, you know, the village as a whole. Um, because there's lots of resources out there. Um, any village, you know, we can collect the template of every job position we have and what those duties typically are. Um, I do think you, what would be a better fit for you in this situation is actually a deputy treasurer um, and to have part-time help, um, basically doing the same duties as uh, one of your predecessors did. So um, I think that would be the best thing for you. Um, but for me, I don't think we're gonna require a permanent part-time position. Um, so therefore, um, I think if we amended this six months and reevaluate, see how everything's going, seeing if you're getting the training and we should have a written, a written program with milestones. Are you getting the training you, you need? Are you, are you, you know, is he, if it's EFDR or if we have to bring in another consultant because they don't have enough staffing, whatever it may be, but, you know, are you getting what you need so that you can do all the work that needs to get done? Um, and how do we allocate other tasks um, to other people? Um, I think that's really where, where this needs to be, um, is a, a, a temporary position with a reevaluation. Re yeah. If I can, uh, there's two separate things I wanted to uh, take from that. Uh, number one, uh, the idea of training, there's two different things that go to training here. One is, municipal accounting, because people don't walk into her salary level and have municipal accounting experience the degree you want. It's just the way it goes in this day and age. And so we definitely need to get her training in municipal accounting to the degree she wants to have that level of training. I have offered to take mayor's discretionary funds and apply it to any classes she needs to take, et cetera, after we get the tentative budget out, which is about March 15th, to assist her with that. I think it's the right pursuit. Dave Bramer, who is the controller and Milton, has offered to help uh, identify different classes with controller and ICOM uh, that she can uh, take and manuals that she may want. So appreciate his help with respect to that as well. Uh, then on the flip side, there's training on our account accounting system, which is what you're referring to, I think, mainly when you were talking about that. And that's an EFPR issue and EFPR uh, We've talked to them and they're working on it, uh, indeed. Uh, it's not going to be an overnight sensation in that respect, but at the same time, we're managing on a daily basis, especially budget coming up. She's working hard to get everybody what they need if they ask for something additional. And so we appreciate that work as well. With respect to the HR question, Terry, as HR, maybe the opportunity to say uh, what you'd like to say with respect to what was said there.
So in all the years I've been there, HR was never um, something that I myself did. It was always undertaken by other people, by whoever the mayor was, they made that decision. So I'm kind of relatively new to it and trying to get things up to date. Um, we have several versions of job, job descriptions. Again, each mayor um, tends to divvy up or make their own job descriptions. So you also have to go by um, village, by state law for what certain people, jobs, jobs excuse me, job descriptions can be. Um, Rust of Village Hall has their own duties to do. And we don't have financial experience. And I don't see how passing out the treasurer's um, duties to the rest of us would benefit us because we still need time to do our own jobs. We're also certainly willing to help each other, but to take on daily tasks that belong to a different part, department, I don't think it's there. Carla, uh, with respect to uh, Deputy Treasurer, thoughts, uh, what were you thinking? You know, it's interesting when uh, Sean said Deputy Treasurer, I had just reached over to the mayor and said, I think Deputy Treasurer. Um, as the Treasurer, you have the authority to appoint whomever you want as Deputy Treasurer because it's your deputy, just like Terry has the ability to um, appoint her clerk, her Deputy Clerk, it would be your Deputy Treasurer. Uh, the board would have to create the position of a deputy treasurer, but I think a deputy treasurer could be part-time, um, but that is something that, you know, might be the way to, to do it. I'm not going to get involved in, in other aspects of it, but um, except to, if I may, Mr. Mayor, to indicate uh, what Terry was saying, a lot of the job descriptions in, in many, many villages look like these job descriptions. Nobody really has actual, I mean, some villages are, are very sophisticated and have fancy job descriptions. Most of them have handwritten ones. So to that extent, um, you know, yes, you do get job descriptions, but some of them also come from civil service. Some of them come directly from state law. Um, it's not like you can just sit there and create it. And the civil service ones have to be approved by civil service. So at this point, you know, that's kind of where I was thinking with respect to a deputy treasurer, that's something that the board would create the position but you have the right to appoint. Could I ask for an edit uh, or vision of this motion to uh, take out the words, the position of part-time accounting clerk and replace them with the position of deputy treasurer? I believe that was the motion maker here. I'll accept. And the second was from Sean. I'll accept that change. Okay. May, I've been trying to speak for the I'm sorry. <laughs> how many cycles. I, I just want to keep Yeah, no, no, I appreciate that. We really have to take this seriously as we saw Mary Lasky, um, she was treasurer two before um, uh, Barbara, and she, she wrote us a letter, we wrote us an extensive letter of the duties of that department duties of the staff. And there was much more staff back when she was here. So we really need to give Barbara not only the training, of course, we want to get you the training, but the actual staffing support that she does not have right now. So I hope that this board can move forward and support this and ensure that she has the staff she needs to get her job done and do a good job, not just for the board, but for the community, which is the most important part. So as the mayor mentioned, I've talked to a number of individuals that we consulted with, including uh, Fox, um, partner at EFRP, Tina Nigro, who works with the uh, village. Mary Lasky uh, read her letter as well, interpreted a little differently than, than you have. Uh, Dave Bramer uh, and Julia Smith, uh, who is now control of the town of Malta. Um, I also pulled some data from um, AUDs, from the Comptroller's Office on positions and salaries. Um, basically, we, it was sort of a perfect storm when we arrived of having you new, having um, uh, Tricia new, and a new accounting system being implemented, and the conversion of the payroll system. Um, all the AccuFund and EFRP, so yeah, EF, yeah. EFPR indicated that they could provide the necessary support. Um, unfortunately, they are having trouble that they admitted to me in getting staff, and they really haven't been able to 
provide the support you, you needed. Um, so uh, you noted that the duties that had previously been held by the account assistant, you know, was moved over to you and you already had a long, long list. Um, I, in the information that was sent to me, think there's an imbalance in staff assign assignments um, that resulted in you being overloaded. Um, currently, we have four full-time positions plus a volunteer person um, who does the water billing. Um, other like-size uh, villages generally have three positions. Many combine clerk and treasurer and pay that person a, a higher rate and have a deputy clerk and treasurer, this number of them, and then one additional, um, you know, account person. Um, the net total dollars that we are spending for administrative clerk and treasurer positions are one of the highest in the whole capital region. So my concern is that how are other villages doing it with less people and lower lower amounts? Maybe it's this comp combining it. Um, and talking to EFP, uh, EFPR, um, that they did offer additional help that wasn't provided, particularly for the budgeting. And um, the former treasurer, Julia, said that she offered additional help that wasn't taken. Uh, Bob Fox told yeah, me- I, I gotta interrupt there, Liz, because- No, the, it, can you let me- Actually, no, and that one, uh, and Julia knows that I have a good relationship with her. She has not been coming over and we have requested. And the, the, there was one meeting that was supposed to occur with her uh, when she got COVID, when uh, Barbara had COVID, so she could not actually meet up with her and that never got rescheduled. So I, I do have to stop you there and tell you that actually that was incorrect. Well, anyways, that's what I heard. It, according to Bob Fox, it takes one to three years for a person to become fully um, proficient in all aspects of municipal accounting and financial management and you've already got a good head start you you um you know were a deputy treasurer for what a little less than a year um to change accounting software mid-year while bringing on two new people it's basically was a decision we made we should have made that decision because you already had some experience with, with the old um accounting system my recommendation is a temporary six month position, just as, as Sean has said, but to bring in a higher level consultant, somebody who has municipal treasury experience uh, to train and to backfill on, so that staff can get up to speed. So it's a little similar to what, what um, John is recommending. And, you know, because I just see another new person at a low, lower level just having the same problems that you had. Um, so, and I think the list staff structure should be reviewed and, and, and restructured to, to, I think probably need a full-time deputy treasurer, but I'm not sure, you know, the folks that we have now have fulfilled that. But, you know, the clerk responsibilities are not as onerous. And I think they could be reallocated and water billing, um, should maybe be a you know part time position paid or with water revenue or you know as needed. So I have data which I can pass out which shows our expenditures versus other expenditures. Barbara, you can excuse. Oh, thank you. Um, Liz, uh, is there any indication of this data with? Uh, these municipalities, whether or not they have firehouses, multiple police department, DPW, the size we do, water, sewer. Look at the last columns. Mm -hmm. And so there's five, five sets, six, seven, eight. Yeah. And look at the dollars. I am. So the only colony has spends more money on these three functions than we do. Are, are you sure that there's not an F fund and a sewer fund that aren't hiding other numbers? I looked at those. 
because all I'm seeing are A's. Well, I just put the the the, the uh, codes into, you know, they they did include they didn't have separate they didn't have personnel costs in those functions. So in 2020, the uh, the fiscal year 2020 expenditure for Treasurer's Department in the Village of Balsa Spa was $140,000, which in today's dollars is $155,000. The current expenditure in the Treasurer's Department, if you include Trisha's position in that, which is tangential because it, it, it's not fully eligible, but we'll, we'll do it for the sake of argument here, is uh, with Barbara's salary, $96,000. So $96,000 current dollars versus $155,000 in today's dollars. And we're saying fill in the gap with $24,000. Well, what would the, the yeah. you're quoting the year where we had Mary Lasky working with Julia. That's exactly what I'm recommending is that we, for a short period of time, pay more to get that expertise in and to get people up to speed. That is very different than a full, full time, I mean, a, a permanent position. We did this before. When I went into office, we had nobody, no account staff, zero. And Mary, Larry brought on Mary, and I actually helped her get that first budget out. We were elected in March, and we had a budget to do immediately. And then- um, Larry, Larry actually, worked on that entire budget list. Hmm? Larry worked on that entire budget, and works workbook. Um, well, I was in the office an awful lot, we're running an awful lot of numbers with Mary, so you, know, you can check with him. I did. Well. My memory's a little different. I can show you the files. Um, anyway, that goes without saying. When we brought on Julia, we kept Mary on so that she could get up to speed. I think that was a good strategy. We should repeat that strategy. There, there are um, resources. I talked with uh, Tina about this. I talked with all of these people, and they thought that was the a viable alternative and would provide a higher level of training and support to our staff. Interesting, because I talked to Tina on Friday when she asked if she could call you because she doesn't usually deal with uh, members of the board, usually just the mayor, and I said, by all means, please call her back. And we had the conversation about her expectations, thoughts, and as I had stated to you, and you sort of discussed here, but I will correct fully the record on this, they offered in the first instance that Barbara kind of gave a call for help on stuff, the idea of perhaps helping with budget issues and possibly department meetings, to which I said to Tina, Tina, don't take this the wrong way. It's not meant to be mean or anything like that, but you made a lot of promises about what you would provide in the first place. And you're struggling in that. You're a little bit underwater right now. So I wouldn't accept any other job additions for EFPR at that point in time, because first off, budget stuff, we need to take care of in house. I don't see how they're gonna do much to assist in that process. Second, I'm not sure I would get it when I'm asking for that situation. So the question about whether temporary or permanent uh, that I asked her flat out on Friday, because we had had our meeting, uh, you, me, Barbara, Terry, uh, was flat out, it should be permanent. And as I stated in that meeting, you can sit there and state that work will change, but what we've tended to do as things have changed in our office is we've thrown more curveballs along the way. For instance, we've had two USDA loans in the last eight months alone. Those are not small processes. Uh, you question why Barbara would do such a thing. These are loan applications. There were 20 attachments, 18 of which, give or take, are either financial or financial history. These things aren't gonna be changing as you just approved, uh, essentially loan and grant uh, funding uh, questions for $18 million worth of projects. Uh, who do you think that falls on, the shoulders that falls on ultimately the treasurer? And so there will be more special events or one-time events, which aren't really one-time events coming to that department over the next years. So this notion that this should be temporary, 
I disagree with. Sean, if it'll get a yes vote from you at this point and to get rid of this situation for now is so that we it can- It needs to be temporary. Or, uh, I, I let me it. finish with the sentence. Hey, you interrupt all the time. I know, <laughs> I'm just, I was, I was getting to the point that you was gonna answer what you were asking for there to December 31st of this year, just to round out the year. January, January 1st, uh, 2024, how's that? Okay, well, if we're gonna bargain, I'll go eight months. That's as far as I can go. <laughs> No, eight months. That's it. I, it, does, it doesn't make eight sense months. knowing that That's it. it doesn't eight make months. sense. Hey, 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 guys, 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 Sean, Sean, Sean. It doesn't make sense to cut it off before a year end because things like ARPA, we just identified, work on calendar year. We've got calendar year issues too. That's why I'm trying to take it out to there. Yeah, it's not eight months. Here, but Sean, can you work with eight months? One? Sir. I already, Sir, your tone is unnecessary. I'm, I'm talking but, calmly. I, uh, let me finish, sir. I'm talking this calmly. This isn't going to change. We can stay here another two hours, and my answer isn't going to change. Don't threaten the public. Um, <laughs> I'm not threatening the public. Well, so, tone, again, I'm trying to have a conversation with you. There's a need. I don't think changes, whether it's six months, or I think a year would be sufficient, or what mayor's asking is December 31st, which is last. Um, I, I, I say we give it a shot. There's an obvious need for staffing in that department. And to dicker around six months, eight months, December 31st, it's not negating the fact that there's still need. And it's still temporary if we're saying the 31st or eight months or a year. So, I am fine with the 31st. I will accept that as a motion change. Sean, I mean, this has got to get done. I'm not done. And just, just to confirm the wording, though, for the uh, purpose of what you're saying, sorry, I did not mean that. Uh, it would be uh, the position's maximum number of hours so, uh, per week will be 19 hours, and it will be on a uh, temporary but renewable basis uh, with the initial expiration be December 31st, 2023. Bernadette, would so, you accept that? I you, will accept that. This is a lot. And I'll go to you and ask. Okay, so, well, hold on. It's Sean's yeah. call here. Okay, folks, it's, it is Sean's call from here. What to do with it Sean's because it was his second. Thank you. No. Okay. So, I, I, I have something to say. Can I say it? Hold on. We, Go ahead, Liz. Can I say something? Sure can. Oh, please. I said no. No, I said please don't. <laughs> um, there's, just for procedural, there's been an amendment to the motion that Bernadette made. Bernadette said she would accept the amendment before any further discussion procedurally. It has to go to Sean to see if he'll accept the amendment to the motion. If he says no, then we go back to the original motion. I just want to make sure everybody understands. The emotion that was last approved that amended. Okay. Yes. Okay, Sean. No. Okay, so you're back to the original motion that was already made and seconded. For discussion. Which is uh, unlimited duration as, okay, just checking. My question is, My question is, is what are you going to cut in our next budget? And, and what are you cutting? Well, pay for this. I don't know if you need to quote unquote cut anything. The assessment in Milton up went up $10 million. So that is right there, $50,000 additional. So there's that. Uh, on top of that, uh, any tax cap applied to that is two to an quarter, whatever uh, the levy is allowed to be because of the state's computation. So there's that as well, which is another $36,000, give or take. So that's about $86,000 right there. And our costs have not gone up. Next Four. year's budget is not going to be higher than this year's budget because of inflation, and because of gasoline costs. Nobody's saying that, but when I brought up inflation contracts. for water. No, I'm saying, look, we were elected to watch the dollars. That's what us trustees do. And, and that's their positions watch the dollars, don't they? I can't Oh, I'm going to abstain. For one, you didn't provide us the information, and this is something you have done repeatedly. This is what you did with the fire trucks. You wait to the last minute, send things. 
you don't send a complete set of what we describe, which is all available. Liz, you got Barbara's job description, Trisha's job description, Jennifer's job description, Terry's job description as clerk. The clerk is a role inside the law that exists according to law. But why didn't you send us that description? Because it's irrelevant to whether or not we put a $24,000 part-time now deputy treasurer position into play. Well, it's relevant to the total amount dollars spent on personnel in Village Hall to support the administration. Well, clerk is uh, got another year and a half, I believe, before she would be expired. So there's not much you can do about the fact whether or not you like Terry or the job she does. So this has no effect on it. That's one of the reasons why it is irrelevant. The relevancy was sent to you with the annotations because I thought it would be a good exercise to show you what people are doing. In fact, Jennifer's role, in fact, Jennifer's role, which you probably don't realize, I don't know if you read it, uh, can be partially apportioned now to DPW because she's our DPW administrator. So for all the office staff position stuff that you put in, she's probably a good third to a half DPW administrator in her salary. And in reading her job description, it sounded like she had HR. There, the only part of HR I have is the sexual harassment component of it. But the description indicates that I can even read it if you like. Where is that one? You mean the ones I didn't send you? The one you sent. Under the authority of and when appropriate consultation with the mayor oversees and coordinates the personnel practices and work of all village employees, including but not limited to the maintenance of personnel files, employee and retirement benefit plans, wages, salary plans, safety programs, in-service training, implementation of staff performance evaluation, and compliance with all human resources policies. And what else does it say there? consults on recruitment and employment of employees, coordinates with the treasurer on preparation of annual budget and capital projects, coordinates fixed asset inventory for village and maintains up-to-date equipment and vehicle. Um, the first paragraph you noted you don't do, and this one I just read you don't do, formulates policies and makes recommendations to the board of trustees uh, uh, such measures may be deemed necessary or expedient for the improvement of the administrative uh, services. Never been asked. You never asked me to do that, so that hasn't. No, no, I'm just talking. I, I'm not criticizing. I'm just saying that what's written here. There are aspects of HR that I do do, and there are aspects of HR that I don't. Okay. Um, public communications, you are doing, I believe. Can we talk about deputy treasurer by any chance? So anyways, it looked to me that these job descriptions, also my question is, why was tasks that were performed by the previous person who held the, what is it, uh, deputy clerk, registrar, receptionist, why were these? I'm glad you asked. I took a look at her job description, the account type is one, I believe it was. And I was blown away that somebody who was making, I believe, $38,000 a year was doing all the things that she was doing and the job description and the educational requirement. That is clearly a $48,000 to $50,000 a year job with minimum wage where it is today and everything else that I'm aware of out there. And so we actually filled it with a $36,000 a year position. And here's what we did. For some reason, Treasurer had deputy clerk role. <laughs> That's a front of the house type of role because what walks through the door uh, with deputy clerk and deputy of uh, register of vital statistics, that's all front of the house stuff. The people come in for their birth certificates or for death certificates or whatever else. Uh, we had somebody that was in the back of the house handling front of the house type matters like those. It made no sense. And why would we want to divert the attention of our treasurer when she's got a lot of other things going on to that kind of interfacing when not necessary. So we push those things to the front of the house. What we are maintaining and have retained uh, up front is the uh, aspects of water, billing, and receipts. That's twice a year. That's a total of four months. And village taxes, same thing, two months. So six months out of the year, you basically have 
that position completely inundated with phone calls, in persons, and handling of the bills with Bob. And the other thing, as uh, Ben had pointed out, and Ben's not here obviously tonight, he's got some uh, feeling things that he was dealing with, so appreciate uh, his uh, input on this along the way. Uh, Bob Kavanaugh will eventually retire, and there's some need to make sure that the tasks get over to somebody else, or at least the knowledge of how to handle our water system. And that's what we're working with Trisha on right now, is to get her a better understanding so that somebody in the office has that level of understanding. Barbara has enough things to do during the day, so you know, water should not be her concentration, and that's what we've been doing as well. So to answer your question, you are underpaying the person in front badly. And on top of it, we had a mismatch of roles in the back in the front of the house that we tried to resolve since, just like we tried to resolve with Jennifer's role with respect to seeing that she had some extra ability and we knew that Jeff needed some uh, administration help. And so that's what we did. We turned her into essentially our DPW administrator still inside our office because it provided the buffer we needed. So there you go. That's what we assess over the last 10 months of me being mayor and Terry and I and Jennifer have all kind of ping pong these things back and forth to make sense of them because we deal with them on a daily basis. I still say, what are other villages doing that cost them less money to do the same tasks that we do? And you know, I think that needs to be explored. I think you, maybe you should talk to the other mayors and see why, how can they do it? for the amount that they do do it. Because I just don't feel comfortable to keep bumping things up. Temporarily, yes, add the dollars, but not permanently. And again, I, I, don't, I don't feel I can vote on this unless we put a term on it. And since we're back to square one, I'll recommend a six month term. I'll second that. It's not yours to second. It's Bernadette's motion. Oh. To be honest, I am so concerned about the need for help that I would rather see something long term. So, so can you, Sean? Can you send the microphone just so that folks at home? Thank you. Sorry. No problem. So, just like, so I can understand, Sean, why not December 31st? I think. The shorter term will motivate training because I think if we if there wants to be a reevaluation, um, I don't personally it'll be contingent. Did Barbara receive the training she needed? Um, is, are the other staff receiving the training they need to help Barbara? Um, uh, it's got nothing to do with election day, right? So that's that's my feeling. So would you accept December 31st with the contingent on an outline of the training that you were hoping for Barbara? No, six months. I don't understand. Your concern was the timeline. So if we have a contingent. Well, I part think of if we have a uh, aggressive timeline, things will happen. I think the longer you stretch out, that means less will happen. Uh, it's just a natural course of things. Well, no, I don't, I don't want to necessarily stretch out. I, I think Barbara is motivated and wants to have that training. But the concern is we've already, with our, our, um, if our I'm going to get the letters wrong, but they've indicated, as you said, that they're, they're struggling with some of the timing. And, but we, we are figuring out ways, I think, with like, um, Frank, you'll have to remind me, was it um, the Tom Milton? Uh, Controller who was willing to kind of help, and so I, I, I really think that we can get an outline of of a schedule as far as training, but I do think we need that additional time. Mary, what is reasonable in your mind? I, what you just stated is fine. I, I just one of the things I want to push out there is the conversations with Barbara about the thing she hates the most about this job in particular is the politicization of everything that occurs. And what I'm trying to do is take this out of a political cycle, ultimately, so that we basically base it on something actually not political, but realistic, the end of a calendar year, which we know has a financial implication. 
and work that comes with it. Mm -hmm. So I'm listening to what our treasurer is saying is one of our biggest faults here, which is the politicalness that we go through of everything that hurts her performance because she hates having to play that dodge game the way it has to play out. And here's our ability as a board to send a message to her that we get her message loud and clear. I ask for December 31st, Sean, for realistic reasons, not political reasons. Um, six months. And we can either amend that or we can vote. That's very honest. Hold on. Hold on. I'm going to express that I'm disappointed. I truly am. And um, we're, we're, I, I don't think that December 31st is going to hurt anyone. I think it's wise to, to, like the mayor said, get out of that cycle and, you know, give that time. Um, I'm disappointed that you don't see it that way. Um, and that's okay, we're gonna disagree. Um, I still like you, you can laugh at jokes and whatnot, but um, it doesn't negate that there's a need for help and longer term help. And um, at this point, I don't think I can, I see Carla writing something. Maybe if I draw it out, maybe Carla has the right solution for everybody. Um, <laughs> You said eight months was uh, something you're willing to do? Uh, six months. Well, it, actually, yeah. earlier on, you said yeah, eight no, months. We're back to six. I'm not sure why. Seriously? Yeah, six months. Oh, I'll be the bigger man, sir. I was the bigger man. Excuse me. People play games, so now we're okay. back to square. Right. Barbara would like to speak. Thank you, Barbara. <sighs> Sorry. You're fine. Um, so <laughs> I just, I have concerns about trying to find someone to work for six months um, or temp or what, what you're suggesting. And I also have concerns because there was a lot of things that were left undone because there's not a lot of time. And I think that if we have someone to cover a lot of that, we can have a manual, we can work on a manual, we can work on projects, we can implement new things. And I have concerns about those things and I just wanna bring those up. And, and I completely understand, Barbara. And by no means, this doesn't mean that at six months, that's it. What I'm saying is I'm setting something so that we have a milestone, we have a deadline to get certain goals done. Because I know how job creep happens. I see it all the time, and, and schedule creep happens. So this way, we have a definitive deadline, <laughs> and if we need more time, then we can review it and reevaluate. Maybe we can go for another six months if necessary. But the point being is, if we don't set something concrete that's somewhat aggressive, I'm just afraid that the training you need, the things that you need, are just going to slide and slide and slide. And particularly when we get to a time of year where people might be otherwise occupied um, on other things, um, that this won't be a priority. And I believe it's the number one priority. I take that personally, Sean, for a simple reason. I deal with her every day. I deal with Terry, Jennifer, uh, Tricia, Bob, every day. And my job, my role inside that office is to essentially make sure that they have what they need, that they're comfortable, that essentially it's a positive working environment where I can influence that fact. And to suggest that we're just going to ignore her needs or desires is a personal slap in the face. It's unnecessary. And it, the reality is we've been pushing and promoting this idea for weeks right now for the simple reason that we know that she's uncomfortable with what is transpiring and it needs to be fixed and fixed permanently. And we've brought in multiple people to give their ideas on it. Mary Lasky, Tina DeNigro, Dave Bramer, and others. And every single one of them thought that the option of bringing in a higher level person who can do a lot of the training hands-on was a viable option. And 
that would be temporary. And at that point, we could reevaluate to see whether we needed to hire a, a full-time person. Who is this magic person, if I may just for a second, who's this magic person you're gonna find for six months of that there knowledge plenty, set? There are plenty, I mean, actually I talked to Tina about it. She said she would ask Bob um, to look into it. And she even agreed which showed how stretched they were that we could go to other accounting firms who provide this service. They provide, a, you know, they, some of them call it a CFO for hire, you know, to, to, to really bridge the gap when you bring on somebody new. This Our is CFO that, is right there. We don't need a CFO for hire. A temporary interim person who is what she will be in another year or so. That's what, because she has only deputy treasurer at this point experience. She's admitted that she doesn't know how to do certain things. Wait, wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, whoa. that so, is not what she has stated. Oh, I mean, I was a deputy treasurer. I'm learning a lot now and I have a lot more that I'd love to learn. Yeah. Um, I was gonna say something. I, I forgot what it was. Um, I think it was, after the six months, so we get a temp to come in and work for six months. That person leaves and I'm back to working 70 hours a week. Is that, I know that there's a lot of stuff that I'm learning, I'm slow at things. We're going through a new, a new accounting system. Like stuff is really hard right now and I know it's gonna get better, but I don't think that I can, that I can just leave those other jobs that were done by someone else before undone after the six months, or am I gonna to have to take them on and just keep working extra hours? I would hope, Barbara, that other staff within there should be able to, to help you out because you did have, there was a, a, a previous employee that helped the treasurer out. And that's why we only needed three staff. And the treasurer was trained by a higher level individual individual, the exact scenario yeah. that Liz is talking about. I wish about. that had been yeah. a possibility. Yeah, so, I mean, we know that that is a proven successful strategy. I mean, the I evidence is there. I would love there. that. Yeah. I think I figured out a lot on my own, but I would still love some, some confidence that I think I would get from someone saying, yeah, you're doing a good job. And who knows what the job is? I, right. I would appreciate that. But at the same time, I don't think we're going to get a temp that's going to. Um, I think there could be a temp that maybe we could keep on after, but I, I don't see the hours decreasing, the need for the hours to decrease. Um, well, okay. I mean, so you're saying that you feel like there's nobody else currently in the office that would be a the appropriate training could could take on the task that there was already a position that they filled prior that did that work, did those exact duties. I, I don't know. I don't think so. I think there's been some restructuring. Um, I know that in preparation for Bob leaving, I know Trish is gonna be learning a lot about water. I think that we have a volunteer now and he's awesome. Well, one of the great things we could do, whether it's six months or more than that, um, is look into automated water billing, thereby re reducing the amount of time dramatically. Um, the Office of the State Comptroller actually does water audits, so we might be able to uh, look at that and just completely streamline our system so that it significantly reduces the amount of work. And maybe a part-time water person because it's every six months where things get busy um, around those times that we could hire somebody temporarily. Um, I think all of these things have to be rolled into that six months term. So we see progress on all these things because these aren't new ideas. These ideas have been put out there. It's just the can has been kicked down the road, down the road. So and I think at some point down. we need to say, yeah. okay, here's a deadline. And this is what we're going to stick to. If you don't hit the deadline, okay, tell me why. Great. All right. We can extend the deadline this much more. What's your plan? So the deadline is for me to get training 
That's really the And then I'll be I able see. to do all of that work. Is that I'm not happen? saying that. I'm saying not only you get trained, we need to assess training an individual with, within there. And if that doesn't seem feasible, what are our next steps? Okay. And that's something we can reassess in six months. And the decision obviously is not mine, but I just wanted to express that concern about hiring a temp. And I think that would be difficult to find um, and train. And that's it. Thank you. I do agree about finding a temp for six months or temporary staff. Um, we know that the, the job market's very competitive right now. Um, and I think if we are offering something more long-term that we have a better shot at finding a part-time staffer that can help in that department. So I don't think this is the right way to go. I understand the desire to want to set benchmarks and I think we can do that separate to um, a six month period. So that's my thought. It sounded like you like the idea of a you know consultant type person coming in to for the six months where you can actually you know through an accounting firm um, hire somebody temporarily. That's what they do. I mean you know that does sound like you were favorable to that. That wasn't what she said at the end of that. She said, if I remember correctly, or if I'm wrong, with some level of sarcasm in her voice, you expect me to go get training and then be able to, at the end of that six months, handle everything that comes to the office. I'm talking about what she said earlier. That would be great if she had, no, if she had somebody who was more experienced than her, who had been, a, Bob Fox says it takes two to three years before somebody in the treasurer role has control of that knows what they need to know and you already have a year the That's idea true. is to bring in a higher level person for six months to do some of the work with you but also train you um, and maybe decrease the amount of off-site training you need because there's a person there you know half time or whatever um, providing that that is the pattern that we did with Mary Lasky, and that worked very well. Six That's months brings her to a year, Liz, and Mary Lasky has stated in no, in no uncertain terms that she needs permanent assistance in that office to uh, take over all the hours. Whether or not Trisha added to her duties, there still would not be enough hours in treasurer-type role, and especially at, at these salary rates, Liz. You had a $65,000 a year treasure relief for an $80,000 job. You had a $38,000 account type is one that left for far more than what she was being uh, paid. So you've got to understand that the value you were getting and the salary you were paying was two different things from the actual numbers to what they really were. And eventually they left us with good reason. And so now we sit here at 36 and 60 and we expect things to become any better or less volatile in this situation, what we're trying to do is essentially say, hey, well, let's fill in the gap a little bit with the savings we enjoyed here uh, with the $24,000. And we've got people here that we're trying to be reasonable, say, okay, we understand you don't want to make it a permanent scenario. So December 31st, so at least we get through calendar year end for the issues that come up at the calendar year end in our village, even though we're on a different schedule, not everybody else is. Which is still going, you're agreeing to a temporary position, and she said, well, what? Longer temporary position. Yeah, yeah. So we're so, trying so to meet when, you. When so. I think here, I'm going to be the huggy feely one in this moment right now. <laughs> what I'm hearing Barbara say is that she's working 70 hours. Is that what you said? I, I know you've been here on weekends. I've known that you put in a lot of time and you know what, she's a mom and she deserves a life outside of here too. And that requires giving her some staff. And I, I, I just think that at this point we are asking so much of her and not giving her the help. And to, to say, oh, we're gonna give you help for a little bit, but then take it away. And then that, that idea that she's gonna have to bear all of that by herself until we figure out what we're gonna do because we certainly have a hard time doing that. Right now we have a solution. I think it would give her the help she needs and I think she deserves that support. And it's sad that we can't provide that to her. Um, you, know, you know what Liz, 
you know what, I, <laughs> to call me dramatic, to call me dramatic is unfair. I find, I just find it so hard to call, to call and ask somebody to deal with all of that and to serve the community and give up so much time with her family. It's, uh, that's, to, no, you called me a dramatic if that was unfair. So I hope that you take that in consideration when you make your decision, the impact on our staff who give up so much of their time for our community. And I, if I have to be dramatic, my goodness, I will be. I, I am. I'm trying to give her more help than you are by bringing in somebody who has the skills at the level where she is going to attain with time. That's what I'm doing. I'm not taking, not saying that she needs to do this work. I think she'll find it difficult with this new lower level person because they're gonna be brand new and not know what to do either. And then she's gonna to have to train them. So I think bringing in a senior person who's going to train both her and whoever else. So, and, and really, I think we should have had this discussion, not an open session, really. But we couldn't get anything from you over the last weeks. We Liz, enough. You Friday morning, you had what you asked for that was I relevant to this. Enough with the lie. Please, it's not helping. But it, it was helping. requested two weeks prior. No, it wasn't actually. It was requested a week earlier, and we put it together. And Je I would have had them out Thursday, but Jennifer unfortunately had a family day that she needed, and I didn't have hers. So I wanted to send the three in tandem. I'm sorry that it took an extra day because somebody in our office staff needed to have a life outside the office. Exactly. Right. Okay. It happens. Times we requested over the period of a little over a week, literally. We said, we need job descriptions. We never got a positive, oh, I can get that for you then. We wait, you waited until, this is the same pattern you've done with other things. Liz, so I, provided, I provided, I provided, I provided all the information you needed at any uh, point no, in time. You did yes, not. I did. I explained what Trisha's job was. I explained what you Jennifer explained does. I explained what she Barbara give us does. A, a, a job description. You know, Frank, I know you've never been in a management situation. Actually, I have, Liz. I was COO of a company. Next question. COO. Well, obviously, you didn't learn how to do normal business. This is a business, like a business. You provide a job description when you propose a new job. You provide the rationale for why you need that job. There were 25 emails from you over this period, and 12 of them had criticisms of us. If you spend less time counting my emails, more time reading the job descriptions you got on Friday morning, maybe I you would have put out that today. email you promised us on Friday saying you were going to give us the assessment. Because I also have a life. I also have a life. And I told You're not you allowed to have a life, Liz. If they're not allowed to have lives, why should we? Well, I work a good 20 to 40 hours a week on village business for $4,000 a year. And I work 60 to 80 for $7,700. What's your point? That's the job we signed up for. Get used to it. You can quit if you want this. No, I'm not a quitter like some others are. That's uncalled for You know, you said I could quit, so I could. You're making a sharp guard. This is the thing that I wish all of us can try to be better about. And me included, sometimes I get upset by comments that are made, but we make a lot of sharp barbs to each other and it includes you as well, Ms. Cormos. And, um, you know, but we're getting distracted from what needs to happen, what kind of support we need to give Barbara. And I just like us to focus on that rather than her feelings about what's been done. So I, I don't know how we, we proceed forward, but we're getting distracted from what needs to be done. Yeah, let's take a vote. I'm looking, I'm looking at you as the voice of reason sometimes here, Sean, at this point before I move that. I know, I know, it's amazing. It's a <laughs> Cowboys fan and all. <laughs> Again, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm more than happy to reevaluate this in six months. And if we still think there's a need, I'm happy to approve another six months. But I'm, I, I would like to set that timeline um, so that we can see some progress. Um, and I think that um, it's important to have 
uh, you know, a shorter timeline. I, I understand, the, you know, the reasons besides, well, let's go to the end of the year. Um, but again, I think let's set six months. And if it's, it's obvious that we, we need, still need another person, um, that we haven't been able to reallocate tasks or divide things up or reduce tasks through outsourcing HR or, uh, you know, maybe automating water billing or, you know, creating some sort of digital format or at least moving forward, then we can certainly, you know, renew the term. Um, but um, I'll, I'm happy to vote on this for a six month term. Um, I can't support it otherwise. With an automatic renewal that actually takes a proactive uh, ceasing of it, would you do that? Explain. Automatic renewal. Automatic renewal, but you could cease it with motion at the end of that six months or just before. Yeah, that way they're not floundering, you know. Yes, go right ahead. Sorry. Trying to get everybody out of here before tomorrow. I don't see my kids, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm not <laughs> um, my what I was what I'm trying to hear from everyone is you know there's a need and there's a time limit for whatever reasons that's fine but a lot of times you can say it's a six month from when someone is actually hired because it may take a month to get or two to get someone I know our firm has had people accept positions and not show up and I know that is normal in HR right now unfortunately so what if and I, as the attorney, I'm just throwing this out, not as a policymaker. It's a six months from when someone is hired with an automatic renewal for six months. But if at the end of the first six months, this board decides to come back and say, um, you know, we don't want this, you have the right to do that. But if you don't, you don't have to take an action to continue it for another six months. And then after a year, you reevaluate the whole thing. It's just a thought process. But isn't that going to just discourage his said any person that they know they can be cut off. You're still gonna have the majority in six months, Liz, if that's your concern. No, right? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the ability to attract a qualified person when they know at six months they can be booted. You're the one implementing the whole six months idea in the first place. I am, no, I am not. I am implementing a six month consulting contract with somebody who is at a higher level. Liz, we need somebody to do the work in the office. That is what is not getting done. Do work as well as train. This is the same issue with the DPW position. This was the same issue with the DPW position you folks created, where you were creating a middle management position when they needed a laborer, realistically. That was what they needed in DPW. We fixed that, thankfully. We got Jen half time over basically helping out over there because we saw the reality of what was needed. You're doing the same thing here. You're trying to create a middle management position for somebody that we really need a laborer with experience, obviously, to some degree, but you're creating middle management, not what the fit is here. No, actually, she needs somebody. To, she needs to be a treasurer and she needs somebody at a deputy treasurer level, not at a low level. Okay, that's so what the motion's for. The motion's for a deputy treasurer. And, and so I actually do like that solution because Sean, say, say we don't meet that training schedule. We can then at that six months reevaluate it. But if things are moving along and, and we can give her more permanent staffing, you know, pending that everything's moving along and starting from when the person's actually hired. I think that's actually a very good solution, kind of trying to achieve both what we're trying to go for. I'm willing to accept it. I'm fine with an automatic renewal, but I, I kind of, I guess my thoughts are, is I think it needs to go on an agenda at that six month period, um, just for me. Right. view and discussion. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll leave it to you to document what the, that's supposed to be, okay. and and hand it over, and you know what the rules are on agendas. So, and uh, yeah, data hire sounds logical. <laughs> okay, yeah. so yeah. let me attempt to unravel what we have created here because it's an appointment position, correct? I noticed you have lots of little notes that doesn't amount to emotional. So, hit it. 
Okay. <laughs> oh, it's not so easy. Can I get amendment to that motion? Uh, Bernadette, yes. so that reads, motion creating the position of deputy treasurer for an appointment period of six months with a six month automatic renewal unless uh, the board determines to terminate the position for an hourly rate and overall payment that does not exceed a prorated amount for the remainder of the current fiscal year based on the date of hire of $24,000, adjusting the annual amount by a percentage increase or decrease that is consistent with the budget of increases or decreases of village offices, staff, generally for future fiscal years. The position's maximum number of hours per week will be 19 hours. The six month period begins on the date of hire of said deputy treasurer. I accept. I second. All in favor? Aye. Is there discussion? No, I just wondered if Barbara's initial concern about hiring somebody who's temporary, because that, that's still there. So I understand that, but okay. that from here, she's going to have the determination to determine what she does from here. And I will endorse whatever she decides with respect to her life and what she wants to do. She's done great work for us, and I, I can say nothing but positive things about Barbara, and I hope that everybody appreciates the job she's done for the salary she's making and the hours she's working. She's done incredible work to help our community. So thank you for that, Barbara. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Aye. Abstention from Liz. Record will reflect. Uh, there is uh, one motion I want to add here, which is kind of it, probably superfluous, but just out of uh, a protection. We had uh, an accepted bid for our old back truck for $20,000 through Auctions International. They uh, got it accepted today. Uh, Jeff wanted me to make sure that we had it in a position to accept that bid. So can I get a motion uh, allowing uh, DPW to accept the bid taken by Auctions International for the uh, old back truck for $20,000 and uh, permitting the mayor to execute any paperwork related there for or there too. I'll make that motion. Trustee Raymond. I'll second. I think we're going with uh, Trustee Fundaints on that discussion. Um, so that's what happens to uh, today's cost, 600000 was it? Well, it, no, it was 475000 I believe, and that has bells and whistles that we really got to appreciate. I, I know on Facebook, we, I had stated it was a water main break. It actually was not. It was a water service that broke apart from the main. And so it became the uh, homeowner, Jason homeowner's issue. So it was their water service, but they did have to go down deep to figure it out. I actually went out on the street to watch some of that. That back truck is amazing. But $20,000 is the correct uh, amount, apparently, for a very, very old back truck that was being held together by duct tape and toothpicks at this point. I was going to buy it. <laughs> it was going, going, going at $20,000. That's all I know. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Any other business? We do need executive session to go ahead. How do you want to formulate it? Uh, to discuss the um, real property um, potential for Woods Hollow because it has to do with the cost of it. It could have a, whatever the statute language actually says with respect to that. And also uh, labor negotiation. And I want to update the board on the Boston 2 litigation. So three things inside of our executive session. You are welcome to come back. However, uh, there should be no action taken, none anticipated at least. Can I get a motion to go into executive session? Trustee Fundainsa, Trustee Cormos, discussion. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries, absolutely. Folks that are leaving, have a great night. Uh, we will be back, though, obviously, a little bit later when we have to close the meeting.
And uh, we are back uh, in session at this point. And uh, as I said, no action to be taken. Can I get a motion to uh, the motion of the attached vouchers be audited and the meeting be adjourned at 10 14 p.m.? I'll make that motion. Trustee Raymond. Okay. Trustee Cormos, discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Good night, folks. Um, Courtney and I went to school together. Well, I saw that. I'm like, yeah, that was, that was, uh, I actually worked. It was like years ago. Yeah, no, I saw that. Like, 